All right. Welcome, everybody, to Planning for Success. This is our annual student webinar. By the way, I know some of you are watching this on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Right now at the beginning, I'm going to encourage you to go to YouTube. YouTube actually works best for this. So while you got this running on your Twitter, go ahead and go to our YouTube channel and, uh, and get on that. That'll help you not only interact with us with comments, but it will also just make for a better presentation. We'll still keep streaming it on Twitter and LinkedIn and everywhere else that we can, um, but just keep that in mind. All right. We're glad to have you here. This is the webinar that is our student webinar. We do this once a year. I would love to come out to all of the medical schools and dental schools across the country and give this presentation, but there's a couple of problems with that. The first one is that, well, it just takes an awful lot of time to travel out, travel back. I literally could not go to all of the medical and dental schools in the country in a single year if I wanted. But the bigger problem is I, nobody has any money to bring me out. Let's be honest. Medical <laughs> schools won't pay. Dental schools won't pay. So here we are. And um, this is what we do. We take advantage of technology to reach you. The benefit of it is there's an awful lot of you. There's over 1,100 of you signed up for this webinar tonight. So we're thrilled to have you. And um, it's a good way to reach hundreds of you all at once, all across the country. A couple of things I want you to be aware of before we get into the presentation. The first one is that we have a champions program. You may have heard of this program. This is basically a free book for all first year medical and dental students across the country. However, we can't afford to send them all one at a time. We have to send them in bulk. So we need someone to pass them out. That's the champion. It's a member of the first year class. And if you're willing to be the champion, we will send you a copy of the White Coat Investors Guide for Students for every member of your class. All you have to do is give us your mailing address. And that's it. And we'll ship you boxes of books that you can pass out. We'll even give you a little bit of swag for doing it. Those of you who have already signed up to be champions, we appreciate you. Thank you very much. If you haven't been handed this book yet, that means your class probably doesn't have a champion. You can sign up at whitecoatinvestor.com slash champion. Also, by the way, um, I love it when people at your school give presentations, financial presentations, and teach you about uh, financial literacy. And so we actually try to encourage that. We have a financial educator award that we give out every year, but those people have to be nominated by you. So if you've got somebody giving these sorts of lectures and teaching you about finance at your school, please nominate them for that award. You can find information about it at uh, the WCI Plus tab at whitecoatinvestor.com, um, but we'll run a post calling for nominations as a blog post uh, probably in May this year. So please nominate uh, your faculty if they've been uh, helping with this financial education stuff. All right, we're gonna get to your questions at the end. All right, so any questions you have, you can post them in the comments on the right, and we're going to get to them at the end. If they're good for me to answer, I'll answer them. If they're good for Andrew to answer, he'll answer them. Most of the student loan ones, Andrew's going to take, but um, just put those in there. Keep in mind, if you're not watching this on Facebook or on YouTube, your comments are not going to get to us. So you've got to be on Facebook or YouTube to give us the comments. All right. Also with me tonight, you can see there is Andrew Paulson. Andrew Paulson is our student loan guru. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit later in the presentation when we get to the student loan section. But if you're wondering who Andrew is, that's who we're talking about there. All right, Andrew, I'll let you uh, duck out for a second and, uh, and we'll get into this presentation. All right. This is planning for success. It's basically financial basics for medical students. And, you know, the truth about financial literacy and personal finance and investing is, it's all very um, similar. You know, no matter what stage you're in in life, no matter what your profession is, it's not that different. But there are a few things that are different. So if you're a resident, you're welcome to stay. If you're an attending, if you're not in medicine at all, if you're a dentist, whatever, you're welcome to stay. Just keep in mind that the focus on this presentation is going to be for medical and dental students. All right, some important caveats. Anytime we talk about finances or money in a medical setting, I think it's really important to talk about this stuff up front. Uh, there's almost a little bit of a taboo about talking about money in medical schools and residencies and medical centers. And so I think it's important to talk about this stuff. More money doesn't actually make you happier. That's not entirely true. Up to a certain amount, the happiness literature is very clear that more income actually will make you happier. 
but that levels out at seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars a year. Beyond that point, it levels off pretty quickly. Now, I didn't go into medicine primarily for the money, and I know you didn't either. We we're all like, you know, Dr. Rick Hodes, this fellow on the right. He's in Africa treating patients with tuberculosis, and uh, and that's you know why we wrote in our. Uh, medical school application essay that we just want to help people and we just love science. Um, but the truth is, if you ignore money, if you ignore finances in your life, it has the potential to make your life miserable. And that's why it's so important to learn this stuff. No, this isn't the most important subject you'll study in the next four years or in the last four years, depending on what year you are, but it is important for you to learn. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jim Dolly. I'm an emergency doctor. I practice in Utah. I'm about 18 years out of residency. Uh, I got interested in personal finance because I got ripped off. I got ripped off a bunch. I got ripped off by about every kind of financial professional you can think of. Recruiters, realtors, lenders, insurance agents, financial advisors, even an appraiser. And so I got sick of it. And in residency, I started reading. I read used books. I lived across the street from a used bookstore and I started picking up finance books and started trying to learn this stuff, interacting in forums online and reading blogs and that sort of a thing. And I realized it was really interesting to me. And so I kept helping people, you know, on internet forums, even when I became an attending. And after a few years of doing that, I realized that I was sick of typing the same thing over and over again into the internet. So I thought I'd start a blog. And in 2011, I did. That was the origin of the White Coat Investor. Started a newsletter the next year. I published a book in 2014. We put a forum on the site in 2016. Started a podcast in 2017. I published another book, The White Coat Investor's Financial Boot Camp in 2018. Also, we started a conference that actually gives continuing medical education each year, the Physician Wellness and Financial Literacy Conference. We also started some online courses in 2018. In 2019, we expanded into some other communities. We have a subreddit, White Coat Investors, r slash White Coat Investors. And uh, we have a Facebook group. We started a YouTube channel that year. In 2021, I published my third book. This is the one we try to give away in the Champions Program. We actually didn't write this one to sell. We wrote this one to give away. And we also added a second podcast each week called the Milestones to Millionaire Podcast. In 2022, we published an asset protection book, The White Coat Investor's Guide to Asset Protection. And we're continuing to do all of this other stuff each year, the conference and the forum and the newsletter and blog and podcasts and, uh, and this student webinar. So that's kind of the story of why I'm given the presentation is because I've been teaching this stuff now for 13 years formally and for another five or six years before that. All right, a few disclosures and disclaimers. The White Coat Investor is actually a business. It actually makes money. There's 18 of us working here and uh, nobody's willing to work for free, it turns out. Everybody expects me to make payroll each month. So while the material, including this webinar, is free to you, we do sell ads. So keep that in mind. If you go to the website, you're going to see ads. But I'm really big on disclosing our financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I don't know that we have any particular conflicts in the material we'll be presenting tonight. Um, but you'll notice on the website, we're really big on that. And once a year, we go through all of our financial conflicts of interest in a blog post we call State of the Blog 2024, which uh, ran last month. If you buy any of our products, though, our books or our course, or you come to the conference, we actually make money, all right? But I'm a practicing physician. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a financial advisor. And if you're not in Utah, I'm actually not licensed to do anything in your state. So this presentation has to be just for your entertainment and informational purposes, not formal accounting, legal, or financial advice. Okay, here's what we're going to go over today. We're going to go over financial literacy, how important it is, and why it's actually part of the cure for the burnout epidemic we have in medicine today. We're going to talk about living frugally during medical school. We're going to talk about specialty choice. We're going to talk about student loan management. And a new section we added to the webinar this year, we're going to talk about investing, if you actually have money to invest during medical or dental school. We're going to talk about owning versus renting your home during residency, and we're going to go over some financial catastrophes. If you can just avoid these the rest of your life, it'll go a long way. And then we're going to have some very concrete steps that you should take advantage of as you leave medical school. All right, the first presentation, or the first part of the presentation is financial literacy. And the whole second half of this book, if you've got it, is all about financial literacy. That's all it is. What's a Roth IRA? What's a mutual fund? How does this stuff work? 
it's financial literacy. The first half kind of gives all the financial advice. The second half is almost reference kind of material to help you learn this stuff that you need to learn. But the truth is that medical school teaches you the language of medicine, not actually how to practice it. Residency teaches you that. But neither medical school nor residency is going to teach you anything about business, personal finance, or investing. However, just like medicine, finance has a language and it can be learned. You can hire a financial advisor to teach you. It's going to cost thousands of dollars, but not much effort from you. We also have an online course we call Fire Your Financial Advisor. You can imagine the financial advisors that advertise with us didn't like that name very much. Um, but the truth is it teaches you how to interact with a financial advisor too. That method of learning financial literacy is cheaper, but takes more effort. There are books out there. Books are pretty inexpensive, but they require even more effort. And of course, you can do this the free way. Blogs and internet forums are totally free, but they do require a lot of effort. No matter how you learn, no matter how you want to learn, this stuff needs to be learned. You've got a second job. It's not just practicing medicine or practicing dentistry. In our 401k world, you're also asked to be your chief financial officer for your home, maybe for your business. You're a pension fund manager. If you don't manage your retirement funds, nobody else is going to do it for you. So what you need to do is get an initial financial education. I recommend you read four books to get that. The first one is a personal finance book. And one you can read is called Personal Finance for Dummies by Eric Tyson. And that'll teach you, you know, 98% of what you need to know about personal finance will be found in that book. You should read a good investing book. I'm partial to the Boglehead's Guide to Investing. This is written by Taylor Larimore and a couple of other authors, all of whom I know personally. Uh, behavioral finance is an important thing to learn. And there's a couple of books there that I think are really good. The Jonathan Clements book, How to Think About Money, is excellent. There is also uh, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, which is also excellent. And then I think you ought to read a doctor-specific book. And I'm partial to mine. The White Coat Investor's Guide for Students is written with you in mind and will help you understand the things that actually are specific to doctors. But if you hate reading finance books, you are in good company. There are plenty of people out there that hate it. It's the most boring thing ever for them. Have I got the book for you? Not only is it free and can be downloaded at that URL on the screen, but it's actually only 14 pages long. 16 pages only counts the last page and the title page. It's literally 14 pages. If you can't get through that, you definitely need to hire a financial advisor and should not be doing this on your own. But part of your initial financial education is also putting a written financial plan in place, written plan, so that you can follow to achieve financial success. The wonderful thing about writing it is you can refer back to it, particularly when times are hard and you know the stock market's down, you feel like abandoning the plan, you can read that plan again and remind yourself of why you made it this way. But perhaps most importantly, by writing it down, it exposes the holes in your knowledge. And, uh, and shows you what you need to go learn and what you need to do to add to your plan. Once you have that initial financial plan, that initial financial education, I recommend you do some continuing financial education or CFE. And that consists of reading one good financial book each year and following a good financial blog or podcast, you know, reading maybe five or 10 posts a month or listening to three or four podcasts a month. That will help you keep up on anything new that comes out. Okay, I said that financial planning is one of the secrets to beating burnout. And burnout's a real problem in medicine. Uh, even medical students are burned out these days. But if you look at the generations, you will see that no generation gets away from it. Whether you're a baby boomer or in my generation, which is Gen X, or whether you're a millennial, um, they've all got burnout. And you can see that if you ask docs about their burnout, you will see that anywhere from 36 to 50% are saying that burnout has a strong or severe impact on their life. I mean, few of you may feel burned out today. I mean, you're still in school, right? But what this says is that in a decade or two or three, a third to a half of you are likely to have burnout. So it's best to start preparing for it and trying to stave it off today. If you ask each of these generations, what is causing them to be burned out, they'll all talk about too many bureaucratic, bureaucratic tasks. Nobody likes charting. Nobody likes doing paperwork. Nobody likes being told what to do by administrators. 
Um, we just want to practice medicine. We just want to practice dentistry, whatever, right? But that's a big cause of burnout. We hate that. We're not spending our time doing what we really trained to do. However, after that, you see that it differs by generations. The millennials, the next biggest factor is just spending too much time at work. But if you ask the boomers, they hate electronic medical records. Uh, it's just hard for them to deal with it because they started practicing on paper. And that transition during their career has been tough for them. And, and they hate, hate it. You know, the millennial generation, they've never known anything different. Those of us in Gen X, we started on paper for a year or two, maybe, but uh, have been on electronic medical, medical records ever since. So that's not as big of a deal for us. This is interesting. So I have surveyed a number of docs, both in person as well as online. I've done it anonymously. I've done it non-anonymously. The results almost always look about like this. If doctors didn't have to work, almost all of them would work less. 47% say they would cut back at work. They'd still practice what they love to do, but they just do it less. Less call, fewer days a week fewer patients per hour, whatever. About a third of them, though, would punch out completely if they had the money to do so. And I think that's really sobering. Uh, it tells us a couple of things. One, many of us are working at least partially for the money. And that's okay. That's what the rest of America does, right? Um, but uh, it also tells me that, you know, if people had their financial ducks in a row, uh, most people would prefer to work a little bit less. So here's some truths about burnout. It's probably never going away completely. And that's because medicine's hard. It's a hard profession. People are sick. People are dying. People are stressed. Uh, the consequences of your decisions are weighty, not only with people's health, but sometimes, health, but sometimes with medical legal factors. Um, here's another truth. Ownership can reduce burnout, but it doesn't for everybody. We just did a survey, an annual survey of the white coat investor community, and it turns out about 72%, I think it was, are employees. You know, most doctors don't own their jobs anymore. Um, I think ownership and having that control of your job can really decrease burnout. But let's be honest, most docs are going to continue being employees. And so that's just not an option for them. And uh, but something to consider. Burnout also has pretty high correlation with depression. It's not depression. They're different, but they are highly correlated. So if you find that you have some depressive symptoms, identify those and treat those. You can treat those obviously with therapy and medication and those sorts of things, but make sure you're treating depression uh, and not just uh, you know mistaking your depression for burnout. There are also institutional and personal factors for burnout. You can put two docs into the same toxic job and one will be burned out and the other one won't. So you can't say it's all institution, but at the same time, you know, in a lot of ways, burnout does come from the way an institution is set up. It's a, a bit of moral injury when doctors are asked to do things that don't align with their personal values. And so you need to work on both factors. The personal factors you can usually work on more readily, but institutions can be changed as well. And you can change from one institution to another. You know what allows you to really make these changes that reduce your burnout, though? Financial freedom having your financial ducks in a row. You don't necessarily have to be financially independent to make changes, but just knowing that you have uh, your finances taken care of will allow you to put those changes in place. I have counseled people for many years that the most important factor they should consider when making career decisions is career longevity. You're just gonna be far better off practicing even something that pays less, let's say physical medicine or rehabilitation, than something like neurosurgery for 10 years. You know, if you can practice PM&R for 30, you're gonna do better financially than only practicing neurosurgery for 10 years and burning out. So when you make a decision, whether it's specialty, whether it is uh, the job you take, decisions that your group might make um, regarding how you staff yourselves or take call, consider career longevity. It really is important. Financial planning can help you beat burnout in a number of ways. You get rid of your student loans relatively early in your career. So you don't have those hanging over your head, forcing you to go to work. Eventually, you probably won't have any debt at all. You know, you pay off your credit cards quickly and then cars and maybe your student loans and eventually a mortgage. And then you have, don't have any debt at all. You also know your value. 
what you're worth. So you're not getting paid less than you should be because you paid attention to finances. You know what people with a job like yours get paid and you're making sure you're getting paid fairly. When you have your financial ducks set up in a row, you can cut back on your call. You can cut back on work days. You can uh, work, uh, you know, fewer weeks a year. Uh, you can cut back. And like I said, when we survey doctors, almost half of them would like to cut back at work. So do the financial planning that will allow you to make those decisions, at least by mid-career. You can also leave a toxic job. If you have some money on the side that you can live without an income for two or three months, you can just walk out the door. That FU money, for lack of a better term, is, uh, is what allows you to leave that toxic job. In fact, you can leave the career completely if you just can't find a job in medicine that doesn't feel toxic to you. And of course, the ultimate solution to burnout is to simply stop working. And uh, by really taking care of your finances, you can retire early, whether that means 45 to you or whether that means 62 to you, it is an option in medicine if you take care of your personal finances. These are some pictures of some of the things I've done in the last couple of years because I took care of my personal finances early in my career. If you start in the upper left of the screen, this is a friend of mine. We went hella skiing in Canada. Now, skiing's fun, but it has nothing on using a helicopter instead of a chairlift. I get accused all the time of telling doctors they can't ever spend money. That is absolutely not my message. While I think you should be frugal during medical school and residency and try to live like a resident for a few years after residency, eventually I want you to be able to spend money and enjoy that income that you have worked so hard to earn. The next picture over is a trip we took to Washington, D.C. That's the Capitol building with my family. Another one is a trip we took down along the Gulf Coast for Christmas. That's the USS Alabama. Um, the lower left is, the, uh, is a hike we did in Arizona. We went down there for a holiday. The center picture at the bottom is me doing canyoneering in Costa Rica. Uh, sometimes it's faster to just jump to the next pool than it is to rappel down there. And finally, it's my wife and I skiing on a chairlift here in Utah, which we do many afternoons because I have been able to arrange my schedule to do such because we took care of our finances early in life. I want you to have an awesome financial life. And the way that you do that is by taking care of your finances in the beginning of your career. So I'm glad you're all here as students tonight. All right, this is a picture I took a few years ago when I was in Hawaii and saw that milk cost almost $9 a gallon. It's probably more now, um, but I, I thought that picture would be a good way to introduce the importance of living frugally while you're in medical school. Most of you, and that's about three quarters of you, are living primarily on borrowed money during medical school. And the truth is that every dollar you spend now is really the equivalent of two or three dollars once you pay it back. So instead of that jug of milk costing nine dollars, it really costs twenty-seven dollars. So you really do need to spend carefully. You know how does that happen? Well, it's the time value of money. You know, as time goes on, money compounds, and it also is the effect of higher tax rates as an attending. Right? You got to earn the money, then you got to pay taxes on it, then you got to pay back your student loans. So you actually have to earn quite a bit of money to pay off all that money you borrowed to live in medical school. So let's say you borrowed $1,000 at 7% to pay rent as an MS1. Then you let that interest accrue for four years of school, three years of residency, and three years of fellowship. Then you paid it back over 20 years. So by the time a total of 30 years have passed, that $1,000 is really $7,612. Even if you pay it off within five years of fellowship graduation, you're still paying almost $3,000 for that $1,000 in rent. And then, as I mentioned, borrowed money is always after tax, right? So you spend after tax money and you pay it back with after tax money. You're in a very low tax bracket now, maybe the 0% bracket. You'll be in a higher tax bracket later. If your marginal tax rate is 45%, you would have to earn $13,840 pay off $7,612. So that's almost $14,000 you would need to earn in order to pay off $1,000 that you used for rent 30 years earlier. So frugal down. There is no easier time in your life to be poor than right now. Everyone around you is poor too. 
You know, nobody expects you to have money. Nobody expects you to go on, you know, expensive vacations with them because they're all poor, just like you are. Eating out can be really expensive. It is really renting out a restaurant for an event. It's not a place you go for food. The place you go for food is the grocery store or better yet at the hospital. There's a lot of free food available at the hospital. Take advantage of that. Remember that you aren't what you drive. The truth is that you can get reliable transportation, not flashy transportation, not transportation that's going to impress anybody, but reliable transportation for 5000 ish dollars. Maybe it's $7,000 these days. It's gone up quite a bit lately. But the point is you don't need a $30,000 car just to get to your rotations. You can get a very reliable car for five or six or $7,000. If you are single, Share the place you live with roommates. All of a sudden, you just cut your rent in half. If you have a partner, if they can work, that can really help with finances, not only paying living expenses, but maybe even covering some of your tuition so you can borrow less. Try to minimize your debt. And the main way you do that is simply by spending less. Spend less money in medical school. Trust me, you will not regret it. If you have some help, you got some money you saved up beforehand, or you're getting some family help, use that first before you borrow money. So you're not taking out the debt until you must. Remember that since 2012, medical school loans are not subsidized. The interest starts accruing as soon as you receive the money. So there's no reason to borrow the whole year's worth of money in August. You can take some out in August. You can take some more out in October. You can take some more out in January. You don't have to borrow it all in, it all in August. Because as soon as you borrow it, that's when the interest starts accruing. You can also work during medical school, believe it or not. That summer between your first year and second year is a pretty likely time to work, especially if it can be something that'll advance your career as well, like doing research. Uh, during that MS4 year, you know there are some down months. There's a lot of downtime. You're not taking nearly as much call. The rotations aren't as hard, especially toward the end of that year after you've already matched. That is a great time to work at least part-time. I did uh, H&Ps at a, at a surgical center when I was in MS4. I thought it was pretty good money. It paid $20 an hour. It probably pays twice that these days. Um, but little things like that help you to borrow less. If you do have to borrow, make sure you're getting the best terms, right? Max out your federal loans before taking on any private loans. There are other types of loans that some people can take. For example, there are home equity loans. If you own a home for some reason, you can borrow against the home. That brings on the risk that you could lose the home in foreclosure, but it may provide better terms than you can get from either the federal government or a private lender. Some people borrow money from their family. Uh, oftentimes it's 0% interest on very good terms. Well, I would caution you about that. It's not always very fun to go to Thanksgiving dinner with somebody that you owe money to, it can be uh, a way to save a lot of interest. Just make sure if this is your parents or somebody like that, and they're not very well to do, that you are protecting them in the event of your death or disability by having disability insurance and life insurance sufficient to take care of them in the event that you were no longer able to earn the money you expect to earn. I've even seen some medical students use 0% credit cards. So they put all their expenses on a 0% credit card. And when the 0% period runs out after 12 or 15 months, then they take out the student loans and pay off the credit cards. Be careful with that. Obviously, you don't want to have a credit card at 15 or 30%. If you could have student loans at 7 or 8%, um, but it is a method that could be used to reduce interest. All right, our next topic is specialty choice. And I'm sure most of you have seen a diagram like this before that tells you how to choose a specialty. Uh, obviously, this is not 100% truth. It's a stereotype, but uh, it wouldn't be a stereotype if there wasn't some truth to it. So work your way down the chart, figure out what specialty you belong in, and uh, you may find that there's more truth than you expected in this diagram. But let me tell you the truth about medicine and money. In medicine, how much you get paid does not depend on how much you know, or how long you trained, or how unpleasant your work is. In fact, market forces don't work all that well in medicine at all. As a general rule, procedures pay better than thinking in medicine. A lot of people tell you the uh, golden years of medicine were 
five years ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago. It's not really true. If you look at salary trends, even adjusted for inflation, they've generally gone up over time. And you can see the last uh, you know, six or seven years of data here. Um, and you can see that, that you know, salaries have gone up. As a general rule, specialists get paid more than primary care doctors. But on average, doctors are making 275, dollars dollars $325,000 these days. You can look at the average income per specialty. And if, you've ne ne if you are never shown a chart like this in medical school, I think someone's really done you a serious disservice. My own specialty of emergency medicine usually stacks up somewhere in the middle of this chart. And typically, you'll see things like plastics and cardiology and orthopedics and ENT uh, up toward the top of the list. And you'll see things like PM&R, pediatrics, preventive medicine, um, endocrinology, family medicine, uh, psychiatry, those sorts of specialties down toward the bottom of the list. However, what nobody ever tells you is that intra-specialty pay varies far more than the difference between the interspecialty averages. I have met psychiatrists and family practitioners making seven figures. I have met orthopedists making low six figures, you know, $120,000, $130,000. There is a huge range within each specialty. It is entirely possible to pick a low paying specialty and still make plenty of money. Besides, if you can't live on $200,000 a year, you have a spending problem, not an earning problem. You know, I tell that joke uh, when I'm talking to students, everybody laughs. They think it's funny because it's so obvious to them. If I tell that to a group of attendings, they don't think that's funny at all. They don't laugh because a lot of them are making two or three or $400,000 a year and living paycheck to paycheck. It is easier to pay off debt and build wealth and give to charity and buy fun, expensive stuff if your income is higher. And the truth is you're going to care more about your income and your lifestyle 10 years out of residency than you do right now. There will be no more idealistic time in your life than when you're an MS3 choosing a specialty. Uh, give a little bit of weight to your income and lifestyle and future you will likely thank you for doing so. I mean, the most important factor when you're choosing a specialty is to choose something you're going to love doing for a long time. So I mentioned earlier, you're going to be better off as a pediatrician for 30 years than you will spending an extra three years of training to do critical care and then burning out in 10 years. But for the love of God, if you love two specialties equally, choose the one that pays more and or has a better lifestyle. You will not regret it. I promise. All right, Andrew, let's bring you up here and uh, I'm going to duck out while you teach uh, all these fine folks about student loans and how to manage them. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get started here. So a little bit on, on myself. I'm Andrew Paulson. I have a master's degree in accounting and I'm a certified student loan professional. I am the co-founder and, and lead student loan consultant at Student Loan Advice, and our team has advised on more than $600 million in student loan debt for doctors and dentists across the country. My inspiration came when my wife and I were trying to figure out her loans from nursing school, and that was my first foray into feeling you know, the, the burden that, that student debt can, can have, especially early on in a career. So Student Loan Advice is a white coat investor company that provides one-on-one -on -one consultations where you'll be able to meet with a student loan pro and discuss the best options in managing your loans. We cover PSLF, refinancing, married filing jointly versus separately, which IDR plan you should be in, and how to maximize your options. We save you time and, and the stress from having to dig into too much student loan literature and bottom line, help you craft a plan to get these student loans out of your life as soon as possible. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is, number one, Student Loans 101, and this encompasses federal student loans, private student loans, and federal student loan forgiveness programs. Number two, we discuss student loan management for students, how to take the principles of, of student loans, and then apply them to your situation. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the landscape. I know that Dr. Dolly had, had spoken about earlier, but it is really, really expensive to go to medical and dental school these days. You can borrow as much as a mortgage, and it's in the two hundred and two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range now. And I mean, it's it's gone up a, a little bit since since you know these numbers back from 2020. And the average borrower that, that we're working with at, at Student Loan Advice owes 320. And we've seen borrowers that have $500,000 plus. It's not uncommon. We see that sort of stuff every day. I even had one doc who had more than a million dollars in, in student loans thanks to a, a very expensive dental residency. So it can be expensive getting through medical and dental school these days. And another point, too, is that if interest rates go down in the future, the federal rate that you had when you borrowed does not go down. Those rates are usually fixed over the life of the loan. So federal student loans are the most common form of borrowing for college. And we always encourage that you take out federal for any of your, your borrowing needs once you have, you know, used up all of $529 or money that you have. But, but after that, use federal student loans. Don't take out private student loans if you don't need to. Interest rates for federal student loans are generally somewhere in the 3 to 9% interest rate range. And they're usually always fixed. There were some older federal student loans that were called FFEL loans that were variable interest rates, meaning that they fluctuated over time. Federal student loans come in three different flavors, direct Stafford unsubsidized, direct Stafford subsidized, and direct plus graduate loans. The, the Stafford subsidized are the only loans that don't grow while you're in school, but they discontinued those back in 2012. So all those loans that you're borrowing for medical school now are going to be those plus graduate, the direct Stafford unsubsidized. Here's four key federal protections. Number one, repayment programs. And we'll talk in detail about those in just a little bit. Number two is forbearance and deferment. This is a loan status wherein you can temporarily put off making payments. And most of you, while you're in school, are in deferment. After you graduate from school, we encourage you to not go into forbearance or deferment. You're no, you no longer want to put off making payments when you get done with school because those loans are accruing interest. And if you're not making payments, you're not progressing towards any loan repayment schedule or forgiveness track. Death and disability. In the event of total and permanent disability or death, your federal student loans go away. They aren't passed to a partner, children, or family, which is a nice protection with federal student loans. And the last there is loan forgiveness. We'll cover the key loan forgiveness options like public service loan forgiveness later on. Direct federal consolidation is a key, and I can't highlight this enough, but for those of you that are, you know, a federal consolidation combines your federal student loans into one or two loans. Interns are able to use consolidation to skip their grace period and begin repayment immediately. Most federal student loans have a six-month grace period or runway where no payment is required until generally November or December of your first year after you graduate from school. During the grace period, your loans still continue to accrue interest and you're not accumulating any credit towards a forgiveness trap. So make sure to consolidate your loans, a direct federal consolidation, right after you graduate in June or July when you begin your first job right out of graduate school.
All right, let's talk about some of the federal repayment programs. There are what I call the the fixed really the fixed term payment options that's standard graduated and extended graduated so the standard repayment program think of it kind of like a mortgage it's fixed monthly payments over a decade the graduated is also over a decade but the payments increase every two years so they start out a little bit lower and increase every two years extended it's kind of like a mortgage it's over 25 years making fixed payments and extended graduated similar to the graduated flavor, but it is over 25 years where payments start out very affordable and then continue to increase over time. Income-driven repayment is the most common we see for early career docs and for residents and for fellows. Income-driven repayment has four different repayment plans. Income contingent repayment, which is going away this year. So not not really something to worry about for most of you. Income-based repayment, IBR, pay as you earn, pay, and saving on a valuable education, save. If you have federal loans, we would encourage you, learn these programs inside and out. Each has their nuances. And if you don't want to do that, hire a professional that can help you out. Income-driven repayment programs. Payments have almost nothing to do with your interest rate. Payments are really nothing to do with your debt burden, and they are solely based on income and the number of people in your family. Here's a table that helps to illustrate how payments work in IDR plans. This borrower has an income of $60,000. As household size increases, you'll see the poverty line increase. The poverty line is a deduction that your servicer takes out of your income when they calculate your monthly payment. If you look at a household size of one, you'll notice how different monthly payments are. Monthly payments are based on your discretionary income, which for a household size of one is 37K or 26K contingent upon which repayment program you pick. All of the IDR plans are, are, are calculated as a percentage of income. ICR is 20%, old IBR is 15%, and save, pay, and new IBR are generally 10%. In ICR, if you're looking at a household size of one, payments are $750 a month, and save is $218. $500 per month is is not going to your loans on a monthly basis is going to be able to help you out a lot, you know, when you're early career, that can go a long way for your budget. If you go down to a household size of four, you'll see that payments are reduced. In the ICR plan, they're 480 and with save, they're actually $0. That's right. If your income's low enough, you could actually have $0 payments while you're in IDR. So let's talk about the SAVE program. This is something that you can do while you're in school. 100% of interest after a monthly payment is made is forgiven. So that means if you have $1,000 of interest a month and your monthly payment is $200, that unpaid interest of $800 is waived. It can help subsidize this interest while you're in school. So if you don't have any income right now, you could enroll into the SAVE repayment program and have $0 payments and have some interest subsidy. But here's the catch. Not all of your federal student loans are eligible to go into repayment while you're in school. Only direct plus graduate loans can be taken out of in-school deferment while you're in school. Those Stafford subsidized, unfortunately, they don't let you take them out of of in-school deferment. Okay, so if you're interested in doing this, make sure you're filing taxes, right? So because they will calculate your payments based off of what you made. So if you didn't make anything last year, you could have zero dollar payments. But if you want to use this strategy, just be aware that each semester as you continue to borrow, perhaps direct plus graduate loans to call your servicer to request to be placed in repayment because they try to move you into in-school deferment each semester. So it's something to be aware of while you're in school. 
All right, let's talk about some of the federal loan forgiveness programs. The first of which is public service loan forgiveness. This is the gold standard of loan forgiveness programs, and we'll talk about that in more detail later on. The next is IDR loan forgiveness. It's another federal loan forgiveness program only eligible for federal student loans, where after you pay for 20 to 25 years, your loans are forgiven, but the balance is taxable, commonly referred to as the tax bond. There's loan recent repayment assistance programs, and these can vary by state and employer. Some of your some of your employers or future employers will help to pay your student loans. And if you work in, in, a, in a disadvantaged, underserved area, that can also sometimes qualify for grants and loan repayment assistance. If you do the military, military can help pay off your loans, but there's generally a service requirement provide, that, that you have to fulfill afterwards. There's also NIH, National Institutes of Health. They can help to pay up to $50,000 in student loans each year. And National Health Services Corp, if you're looking to work in any of those shortage areas, HRSA, mental health, primary care, or they can also generally help, you know, pay about $25,000 in payments per year. Okay, public service loan forgiveness is commonly referred to as PSLF. It was created back in 2007. There have been more than 750,000 public servants that have had their loans forgiven through this program. And that was as of late, late 2023. I'd assume that number's gone up, you know, over the last couple of months this year. PSLF has four strict requirements that you must meet in order to qualify. Number one, you need to be in a qualifying repayment program, ICR, pay, save, IBR. Number two, you need to make 120 on-time monthly payments. It means you'll need to work for about a decade after you finish your graduate degree. And that is cumulative, not consecutive payments. And you need to be working at least 30 hours per week at a non-for-profit or a 501c3. There is an annual employment certification form to complete each year, which allows you to verify your employment that really asks about where you're working so that you can qualify yourself for this program. After you reach your decade, the balance that is owed outstanding after you've paid for 10 years is forgiven tax-free. Most residencies and fellowships are 501c3s, as are a lot of academic 501c3 positions. But there are many out there that are working at non-for-profits but are not actually employees of a non-profit. They're part of a physician group or some type of agency that then staffs them there. Please be wary of those situations because those generally don't qualify for PSLF. But VA, military, CHCs, FQHCs, public health, those are all the sorts of institutions that qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So why does PSLF work? You have low payments while you're in training, generally somewhere in the $200 to $400 range. And the amount forgiven usually equals about what you started with when you graduated from medical or dental school. PSLF is usually the best option if you qualify and the most cost-effective option to get rid of your student loans. But it doesn't hurt to have a backup plan. That's why we talk, that's why there's a PSLF side fund that allows you to hedge against legislative and career risk. This is in the event you decided not to work in public service, you would have enough money set aside that you could throw a lump sum into the student loans and it wouldn't be setting you back and economically devastate you if you had been been making the minimum payments on, on PSLF or if the government decides to get rid of it. Let's talk about private student loans. Private student loans are not as commonly used as federal student loans to finance education. They're more commonly used after graduation when you're looking to potentially lower your interest rate. Private student loans don't have as flexible repayment or forgiveness provisions like federal student loans. Generally, they have fixed terms where you have to pay over 5, 7, 10, 15, or 20 years. Private student loans are less likely to be discharged in the event of death or disability. It's very case by case, whereas with federal student loans, those go away in in total and permanent disability and death. And it is extremely rare 
for student loans, private or federal, to go away in bankruptcy. Private student loans come variable and fixed. And interest rates are anywhere we've seen as low as zero. I've seen 14. Actually, recently, I've seen some some private student loans that have been higher than that. So they can be double digits. So be weary if you have private student loans. And just just be uh, and just be aware that you're going to get a lot. You're going to get inundated by by these private lenders. Private refinancing can be a good option for some. Some private lenders offer refinancing programs that allow for zero to one hundred dollar payments while you're in training. That can be very helpful. It is an excellent option for you that already have private student loans. Your private student loans are generally taken out when your income, credit situation, and savings are inferior to to what they will be when you graduate from medical or dental school. It's not advisable to refinance your federal student loans while you are in school. And generally, if you don't have an income right now, they won't let you do it unless you have a cosigner. Once loans are refinanced, you do not qualify for federal programs such as IDR or PSLF. So if you refinance federal student loans, you can't, you can't qualify for any of those federal programs. So make sure you're making the right decision if you do refinance. All right, let's talk student loan management. There's two main paths for borrowers. Number one, you pay them off, you do some type of refinance, and live like a resident for a couple of years and get rid of these. Number two is loan forgiveness. So how do you pick which, which path you're going to go down? Well, one of the easiest measuring sticks is what is your debt to income? Suppose you owe $300,000 of debt and you have income of $300,000. That is a debt to income ratio of one to one. If your debt to income ratio is one or lower, meaning you make more than you owe, That's a situation that a lot of people would refinance. If your debt to income ratio is 1 to 1.5, you probably got to run the numbers on PSLF or refinancing. And generally, the longer that you are in training, those that have five, six, seven, eight years of training ahead of them after they graduate from medical dental school should be considering PSLF even higher. And if your debt to income ratio was 1.5 or higher, you're probably a shoe-in for PSLF. But it also depends on what kind of employment you seek. If you're planning on working in academia or nonprofits, you can stick with loan forgiveness. If you're planning on working in private practice or a private group, you'll probably need to look into refinancing your student loans. And if you're on the fence, it's probably best to run the numbers to see which would be most cost-effective for you. Let's do a case study. We've got a single emergency medicine doctor who has residency for three years. While in residency, they are making $65,000 per year, and their attending income is $300,000. So you can see that their payments over time, while they're in residency in this SAVE repayment program, are extremely affordable. Heck, they even start out at zero for the first couple of years, and then it rolls in somewhere in the $250 range. Then as an attending, you can see that those payments jump up to about $2,200 per month. Well, let's contrast that with getting onto a standard 10-year repayment, which is fixed monthly payments at at a 6% interest rate. So it's $3,300 a month. And no, I don't expect that you're going to be paying $3,300 a month right after you finish your schooling, right? It's very, very hard to make that payment. But let's just try to look at this over a decade to try to get an apples to apples comparison here. You can see a massive difference in the amount that this that this doctor would end up paying if they do PSLF. They're going to pay $130,000 over a decade. Whereas if they did a standard 10-year plan, they're paying about $400,000. PSLF warrants your consideration if you've got a nice chunk of federal student loans. And in this case, could be, you know, a huge, huge amount of money that doesn't have to go towards their loans. Takeaways. IDR can help while you're in school and while your early career, after you graduate. 
hold off on private refinancing your federal student loans until you're certain about your job after training. For private student loans, refinance them early and often whenever you can get a lower interest rate and consider public service jobs or PSLF after you finish training. Jim. All right. Thank you, Andrew. For those who don't know, Andrew has a certified student loan planner certification. He basically does nothing but student loans all day long. I think he's advised, I don't think it's quite a billion dollars of student loans that he's advised on yet, uh, but it's certainly many hundreds of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in student loans that he has advised on. So thank you, Andrew, for sharing your expertise with us in that part of the presentation. All right, you know, there's 27% of you that were really bored for the last 15 minutes because you don't have any student loans uh, for whatever reason, uh, because you're in a contract maybe for HPSP or an MD PhD, or maybe your parents were wealthy enough to have saved up money for you to go to medical school without debt, or maybe you had a working spouse that paid for it, whatever. Um, and I've learned over the years that there are all kinds in medical school. And in fact, there are people who actually have money to invest during medical school. As bizarre as that may sound to three quarters of you, there are people who want to know how to invest while they're in medical school. So for the next few minutes, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, this picture, by the way, is from a slot canyon in southern Utah. That's one of my uh, friends jumping off a cliff while another one's uh, crossing a pothole above. Uh, pretty fun thing I like to do uh, frequently in southern Utah and around the world. Okay, I mentioned 27% of you graduate without debt. Many of those folks are going to have family money. Those might be in a custodial account, like a UTMA account, or you have a working spouse or whatever. Uh, maybe your spouse has a job during school. You know, if you're in medical school and your spouse is uh, an internist, not only do you have enough money to be paying for your schooling, but you probably have some to invest as well. Or maybe you have a job during school, or maybe you had a prior career and you just need to invest that money that you saved up for retirement in that prior career during medical school. So let me tell you about the best investing move for students. It's Roth conversions. If you have any tax deferred money, you know, money in a 401k or a 403b or traditional IRA or something from your prior career, and then you're going to have a few years with low to no income, you should move that money from your tax deferred accounts to your tax free or Roth accounts because you're probably not going to have any significant taxable income for at least three of those four years during school. Remember that the standard deduction right now is $14,600. It's twice that if you're married. That's basically the 0% bracket, meaning you can get that much income and not pay any taxes on it. So you can do a Roth conversion, if you're single, of up to $14,600 $14, for each of those three years absolutely for free. Now, if you happen to have a very large tax deferred account coming into medical school, you could even do Roth conversions in the 10% bracket. That's another almost $12,000 or $23,000 if you're married. Or, and you can do even more in the 12% bracket. Those are all much lower brackets than you're likely to be in the rest of your career and maybe even during retirement. So you can get uh, some big Roth conversions done during medical school. And in fact, if I had a tax deferred account coming into school, I would try to convert it all during medical school. Uh, if you're going to be enrolling in an income-driven repayment program for some reason, though, try to do your Roth conversions during the first two years of medical school. Because remember, there's going to be a look back at that last year, that last full calendar year that you spend in medical school, the last half of your third year, and the first half of your fourth year, they're going to look back on that to determine what your IDR payments are are going to be. So try to do your Roth conversions early if you're in that sort of a situation. Okay, the second best investing move is also a tax move. It's called tax gain harvesting. And if you have investments that are in a taxable account, they have a basis, meaning what you paid for the investment. And whenever you sell those investments, you're gonna pay taxes on the difference between what you sell them for and what you paid for them or your basis. Those are called capital gains and you have to pay capital gains taxes on those. However, what you may not realize 
is there is a huge 0% capital gains tax bracket. It's over $47,000 if you're single and twice that if you're married. So that means that you could realize gains that you don't have to realize for whatever reason. You could realize them and just update your basis. You could sell them, pay 0% on the gains, and then have a new higher basis. So later, when you sell them again, you know, you sell them, you buy them back, and then you sell them again in many years, you'll have a higher basis. So you don't have to then pay tax at a higher capital gains rate later. So this is a good move if you can update your basis without paying, actually paying any taxes during medical school, make sure you do that. A lot of people ask how they should use their cash. You know, they've got some money coming into medical school. Maybe they've got a few investments, some mutual funds or something, and they want to minimize their student loans. Well, that's a good idea, right? Student loans are basically a 7 to 8% cost these days for a medical or dental student. That's an awfully good guaranteed return right? Interest rates have gone up quite a bit in the last couple of years, but even today, you're only making about 5% on cash in a good high yield savings account or a good money market fund. 7 to 8% is more than that. So that is your best guaranteed investment is to minimize that debt. And so I would use it. If you have money that's not in a retirement account, if it's an investment, you know, it's an Apple stock or whatever, or you just have some cash, I would use it to live on and pay your tuition rather than borrowing money at 7 to 8%. The only exception comes from moral hazard, right? Moral hazard is not a moral term, it's an economic term. And it comes from all this forgiveness that's out there in the world today, right? The government has said, at a minimum, we'll give you public service loan forgiveness, and maybe there will be other types of forgiveness you'll be eligible for. Um, and so people say, well, hey, I'm going to borrow as much as I can because it's all going to be forgiven via public loan service, public service loan forgiveness. I'd be very careful with that sort of mentality. You might not match. Seven to 10 percent of MD and DO students in the United States don't match in any given year. Uh, about 44 percent of those who go to a Caribbean medical school don't match. And so that's a real risk. And if you borrow tons of money and then don't match, you know, you may not be able to get a PSLF job. Uh, there's some risk there. So I would encourage you not to borrow more money than you actually need and to actually use your cash and your taxable investments to minimize the amount of debt that you take on. Do not count on PSLF bailing you out uh, of these sorts of decisions. It the program itself might change. It might become, you know, means tested so doctors don't qualify for it. There's a lot of legislative risk there. There's a lot of career risk with your career path. I would encourage you not to do that sort of a thing. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, some people may make that decision that they don't want to use their investments to minimize their debt because they're planning on going for PSLF. I would also encourage you to keep a little bit of cash around. Keep an emergency fund that's going to keep you from having to borrow on a credit card. Keep some money there for your interviewing expenses as an as MS4. Keep some money to help you move to your residency location. There are some costs associated with that. And you might not even get your first paycheck from residency until as late as the 10th of August. And so you need something to buy groceries with that first four to six weeks of residency. So keep a little bit of money in cash there, but use the rest to minimize your student loan debt. But if you've got money that you truly don't need during medical school or in the transition to residency, yes, invest it. If it's earned income, invest it in a Roth account. You'll probably never be in as low of a tax bracket as you are now during medical school. Uh, I'm now in the top tax bracket and uh, many doctors are in the top uh, one, two, three tax brackets and uh, expect to be there even during retirement. And so uh, take advantage of Roth when you have that opportunity during your early career. If there is a match available from your employer, and this is usually be from your spouse if you're in medical school, make sure you get the match. That's part of your spouse's salary and leaving it on the table is, is a pretty foolish move. Uh, if this is money you're not gonna need in the next few years, this is long-term money that you're investing for retirement or whatever, then invest it aggressively, but intelligently, right? Don't just make a bunch of random bets because this is the money that matters the most. It's the money that has the longest for compound interest to work on it. So if it's really money you're not going to need for 30 plus years, you probably ought to be investing it all in aggressive investments 
like stocks. And I don't mean individual stocks. I mean doing so via low cost, broadly diversified index funds. We're talking about things like the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund or ETF, which has a ticker symbol of VTI. We're talking about things like the Vanguard Total International Stock Market Index Fund or ETF, which has a ticker symbol of VXUS. If you're just looking for something really simple inside a Roth IRA, you can use a target retirement fund. Pick the latest date out there. It's probably 2060 or something like that. And that'll give you a broadly diversified mix of US stocks, international stocks, and just a smidgen of bonds in that account. All reasonable choices to use for money that you're investing for the long run. Okay, that's about all I'm gonna say on investing tonight. Most of you don't have any money to invest anyway. But let's talk for a little bit about the next stage of your life. As people move into residency, I've noticed something. It's this incredible burning desire that graduating medical students, dental students, and especially their partners have to buy a house. Somehow, the mortgage industry and the realtor industry have convinced you that the American dream is not you know, coming to America and building this wonderful life better than what you had in the old country. They've convinced you that the American dream is owning a house. And they tell you that renting is throwing money away. Well, let me tell you right now, renting is not throwing money away. It is exchanging money for housing, okay? which is in a lot of ways what you do when you have a mortgage and you own your house. In fact, when you own a house, you will pay property taxes. You will pay transaction fees, including fees to a realtor when you buy and sell. You will pay mortgage interest. That is all throwing money away just as much as paying rent is. Another argument you hear from people is that, oh, well, rent is more expensive than a mortgage would we be. Well, rent is supposed to be more expensive than a mortgage would be because rent has to include all of the costs of ownership. Plus, if you know there's some investor who owns this place and is renting it to you, plus a little bit of profit for them. So if you're a real estate investor, of course you've got to charge more in rent than what your mortgage payment is going to be. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to pay for the insurance and the maintenance and the vacancies and, and have anything left over for profit. So that's a stupid argument. If, you're, you know, if your decision between rent and buying is limited to looking at the mortgage payment and the rent payment, you are way too superficial on this decision. All right. Um, Here's the other thing. Selling a house for more than you bought it for does not mean that you made money. My wife and I were stupid enough that we bought a condo during medical school to live in. We bought it for $80,000 way back in 1999 when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And we sold it four years later for $83,000, $3,000 more than we paid for it. We made money, right? No, we didn't make money because there's transaction costs. And transaction costs are typically 5% on the front end and typically about 10% on the back end. And so our transaction costs on that were probably $10,000 or something like that, $12,000. So even though the price of the house went up 3,000, we still lost money. And in actuality, if you look at the long term, you typically make money on a house only about a third of the time in a three-year residency and about half the time in a five-year residency. It just takes time for the house to appreciate enough to overcome those transaction costs. Now, the last four, five, six years, housing costs have gone bonkers, absolutely bananas. And so what I fear is going to happen is what happened when I was in residency from 2003 to 2006. We saw everybody making all kinds of money, right? Housing prices were going up 15 or 20 or 30% a year. And so we assumed that they always went up. And so people going into residency in 2006 bought a house. Well, guess what happens? If you bought a house in 2006 and you got out of residency in 2009 or 2010, you were underwater by 25% or more. You couldn't sell the house. And so you ended up having to rent it out and being a long distance landlord. Maybe you couldn't sell the thing until 2015. So be very careful looking at the last few years of housing appreciation and assuming that's going to continue going forward and bail you out from a bad decision to buy a house for only three years. The default decision during medical school 
and during residency ought to be renting. Okay, when you have a stable job and a stable personal situation, and stable means you're going to be there for you know five plus years, that's the time to buy a house, not during residency. Okay, renting will allow you to focus on training. It allows you to know the maximum of what your housing is going to cost. A rent payment is a maximum. A mortgage payment is a minimum of what your housing is going to cost. Plus, everyone tells you it's such a great tax break, right? Well, mortgage interest isn't deductible for most residents. The standard deduction is almost $14,000 if you're single, twice that if you're married. And uh, until you have you know, more deductions than that, The major one for most people is mortgage interest. Until you're paying more than that in mortgage interest, none of it's deductible. And so don't kid yourself that your mortgage interest is all going to be this huge tax break. It isn't for most residencies. And uh, keep in mind also that when you leave residency, it's a very busy time. You're trying to get into a new job. You're trying to move. You're trying to, you know, get established in your career. It can be a difficult time to sell a home. Much easier to just hand the keys to the landlord, uh, get in the moving truck and go on to your new job. All right, so try to fight that burning desire. I give this t- talk to medical students all the time. I think only about 10% of them actually take this advice. The rest go and buy a home and have to learn this from their own experience. Thankfully, about a third of the time, they still make money, but that means two-thirds of the time, they don't. The good news is, as an attending, you usually have enough income that you can make up for this mistake, but why make it in the first place? Okay, let's talk about some financial catastrophes. Um, I try to avoid catastrophes in my life. Uh, Catastrophes when I'm canyoneering in Costa Rica, like in this picture, would be something happening to the anchor to which that rope is attached or letting go with my brake hand on my right side there. Those would be catastrophes. But just like that in your financial life, there are financial catastrophes that can really sink the financial plan of a physician. And these are seven of them. The first one's probably the most common one, living hand to mouth. Second one's divorce. The third one is inadequate insurance. The fourth one is too much leverage. The fifth one is a poorly thought out investment plan. The sixth one is investing related costs. And the last one are those uninsurable risks. We're going to go through each of these one by one. All right, I showed you this uh, thing earlier, right? This is the graph of average incomes as reported on a Medscape salary survey for each specialty. Now, as you can see here, there are docs making $243,000. There are docs making $576,000. Those are, uh, it's a pretty broad range. Uh, And most docs, probably about two thirds of them are somewhere between those two numbers. However, a lot of those docs are actually spending that entire income. It's pretty amazing, really. Um, If you ask physicians what they're worth, what their net worth is, that's everything they own minus everything they owe, you see some pretty interesting things, especially among older docs. I want you to go down to the bottom of this chart. These are docs that are basically in retirement or should be in retirement uh, that are 65 or older. And yes, it's cool that 19% of them have at least $5 $5 million net worths, and most of them are multimillionaires. But there is a full quarter of them that after 30 years of physician paychecks, these two hundred dollars to $600,000 a year paychecks, who have less than a million dollars of it left, they've earned six, eight, 10, 12, 15 million dollars during the course of their career, and they have less than one million of it left. And in fact, if you dive deeper into this information, you will discover that 11 or 12% of them have a net worth of less than half a million dollars. What happened? What happened to these doctors? Well, sometimes bad things happen, divorce, disability, death, those sorts of things. But most of the time, the problem is they just spent it all. And trust me, it is not that hard to spend two or $300,000 a year. You do not have to try all that hard to do it. It can be done as evidenced by all these doctors who are doing it, okay? Uh, These surveys ask doctors, are you a spender or a saver? And guess what? Over half of them say they spend everything they earn, meaning they live at their means, or they live above their means, meaning they are spending more than they're earning. It's pretty amazing, right? If you look at uh, our second catastrophe, is divorce, right? 
And divorce is a big problem because it causes you to cut your assets and your income in half. If you do it twice, you might be cutting your assets and your income in fourths. Um, the truth is, though, that doctors have this reputation for getting divorced frequently. It's not actually true. Doctors are less likely to get divorced than the average American. And in fact, if you're a doc married to another doc or some other high income earner, it's actually only about 10% that get divorced. And so your odds are actually pretty good. But keep in mind, anything that reduces the risk of divorce is your best asset protection technique. All the doctors out there are worried about getting sued by their patients for some above policy limits judgment. That almost never happens. But you know what? 10% of docs get divorced. That is your biggest risk. It's your spouse. Okay, inadequate insurance is the next financial catastrophe I want to talk about. My philosophy with insurance is that you need to insure against financial catastrophe, okay? Not against stuff that's not really going to affect your life. You don't have to insure your iPhone. Well, it might feel like a catastrophe to a medical student. It certainly should not to an attending physician. So what are the financial catastrophes you can and should insure against? Disability. So you buy disability insurance. If someone else is depending on your income besides you, your death is a financial catastrophe from them, for them. So you need to buy some big fat term life insurance policies, not a whole life policy, a term life policy. Uh, you getting injured or ill is, uh, is a, can be a financial catastrophe. It's easy to spend a million dollars on a cancer treatment program and you need health insurance to pay for that. Uh, liability, you know, patients do sue you sometimes and they're sometimes successful. It's best to play with the house money, meaning the malpractice insurance company's money rather than your own money when that happens. But you should also buy some personal liability insurance, which is known as umbrella coverage because it sits over your auto and your homeowner's or renter's insurance. If you have something really expensive that you can't afford to replace, if it's wrecked or it's burned down, you ought to buy property insurance on that. We're talking, you know, home and auto and those sorts of things. Okay, the next financial catastrophe that gets people in trouble is too much leverage right? There's no doubt that the math works. If you can borrow at 2% and invest at 10%, that's a winning strategy. But it's only a winning strategy most of the time because sometimes it doesn't work out. And leverage works, but it works both ways. And real estate investors are particularly susceptible to this. They like to leverage up that investment as much as they can. And then all of a sudden they run into cash flow problems and end up having to get foreclosed on and declare bankruptcy. In those situations, cash is king. So don't leverage things too much. If you get into real estate investing later, put money down. That allows your property to be cash flow positive. A professional investor will put down 60 to 75% of the value of a property, not 20% and certainly not five or 10% or 0%. These zero down you know, methods of buying real estate are very, very risky and you're very likely to go broke doing that for very long. Okay, another risk that can be a financial catastrophe in the life of a doctor is a, a poorly thought out investing plan. You know, Sometimes the plan might just not take enough risk. Right. If you put all your money into CDs and whole life insurance and bonds and, uh, you know, a savings account, you will find that you have to actually save 50 percent of your gross income for your entire career to be able to maintain your lifestyle in retirement. So you need your money to do some of the heavy lifting. So you need the majority of your portfolio to be in a little bit riskier assets like stocks and real estate. Uh, another bad thing to do is trying to time the market. Okay? This is such a terrible idea. It's so tempting. You just feel like if you could just you know, buy low and sell high, you could shortcut the whole process. But the truth is your crystal ball is just as cloudy as everyone else's is. So don't get stuck trying to time the market. Stock picking, also a bad idea. If you're trying to pick the winning stocks and avoid the losing stocks, professionals can't do this with any degree of success. What makes you think you can do it while you're concentrating on your studying or on your career? Don't do that. That risk is uncompensated. You're not going to be paid for taking individual stock risk because it is a risk that you can diversify away by using a low cost, broadly diversified index mutual fund or ETF. A lack of diversification is another great way to have a financial catastrophe. You know, if you put all your uh, investments into a China healthcare ETF, don't be surprised when you get what you deserve. Likewise, there are speculative investments out there. 
I'm talking about investments that don't produce anything. They don't produce rents. They don't produce dividends or earnings. They don't produce interest payments. These are speculative investments. They rely on somebody else paying you more for whatever you bought than you paid for it. You know, it might be uh, Beanie Babies. Ask your parents about those if you don't know what those are. But it was an investing craze back in the late 90s. Uh, they might be uh, baseball cards. They might be gold or silver or platinum. It might be empty land. These days, it's more likely to be something like a crypto asset, such as an NTF or uh, Ethereum or maybe Bitcoin. If you have to invest in this stuff, if you just can't resist, limit it to a single digit percentage of your portfolio. If you've got 50% of your money in Bitcoin, you are making a tragic mistake. And uh, if Bitcoin goes to zero, which it very well might, you're really going to regret that sort of an asset allocation. Okay, not paying attention to your investment costs can also be a financial catastrophe. You know, it seems like a small number, 1%, 2%, 2.5% a year, whatever. But if you're paying 2.5% a year of your portfolio in investment costs, over the course of a 30-year career, 60% of the money your portfolio earns is going to have gone to the financial services industry. Just like your investments can compound over the years, thanks to compound interest, your costs also compound over the years. So you need to watch them and keep them low. If you do need advice, don't feel bad about it. Probably 80% of doctors need or want a good financial advisor, but make sure you're getting good advice at a fair price. And remember that the more you can learn to do yourself, the better. In fact, managing your own finances, being your own uh, financial planner and investment manager is probably the best paid hobby that exists in the world. Remember that low-cost, broadly diversified index funds work in the long run. They work far better than picking your own stocks. They work far better than trying to pick a manager to pick stocks for you, those actively managed mutual funds. Pay attention to costs. They really do matter, and they matter more in the long term, and they matter more in a taxable investing account. Also realize that there are a lot of risks to your career that you cannot insure against. You cannot insure against burnout. You need to take those steps throughout your career uh, that will minimize burnout as best you can. You cannot insure against your own fraudulent conduct, your own sexually miscon sexual misconduct or harassment. Altering medical records is not covered by your malpractice insurance. Neither are criminal acts, neither are problems with drug and alcohol use. So you need to be aware of each of these problems. They have all ruined physician careers and they can ruin your career and your ability to turn your time into money at a very high rate. Okay, as we get close to wrapping up our presentation, be aware we're gonna do a Q&A afterward. Andrew and I'll stay as long as you guys have questions and try to get them all answered. But before we get there, I want to, and you just leave those in the comments, by the way, in case that isn't clear. Leave, leave your questions in the comments and we'll answer them. But I wanna go through some financial steps that you should take as you leave medical school. The first one Andrew's talked about in depth is to do something with your student loans. Have a student loan plan in place. If you've got private student loans, you can refinance them right when you come out of medical school. You can get a lower rate, even if you're only knocking 1% or 2% off them, it's worth it. There are a couple of companies that will refinance you and give you a low payment, like $100 a month. You can afford that as a resident. You can afford that as a fellow refinance those student loans. You're going to have to pay them back anyway, so minimize the interest on it. Secondly, for your federal loans, get enrolled in an IDR program. Probably save as soon as possible and start making those payments. If you end up going for a forgiveness program like PSLF, all those minimal payments you make during training count just as much as the three or $4,000 payments you might make later when you're an attending physician. And so start making them as soon as you can. Do not go into forbearance. Okay? Do not defer your student loans any longer. Once you get into residency or fellowship, start making payments. They're pretty low to start with anyways, often $0 for a year or two if you filed that tax return like Andrew advised you your final year of medical school. Okay, if you're single or your spouse doesn't make anything, SAVE is going to be the right IDR program for you. If you are married to another earner, it's worth getting some advice. I would go talk to Andrew. I'd pay a few hundred dollars and make sure you are enrolled in the proper program, that you are filing your taxes 
uh, in an appropriate way, you know, whether it's married filing singly, married filing jointly, and that you're using your retirement accounts correctly, you know, whether you want to be contributing to Roth accounts or to tax deferred accounts, all that stuff can have a huge difference on how much you get forgiven, how big your payments are, how much of a saved subsidy you get, et cetera. Okay, the second thing is insurance. Okay, you want to buy your disability insurance as soon as possible. Yeah, that is number three. Sorry, I got confused. Buy your disability insurance as soon as possible. Okay. I don't know that you need to buy it during medical school, but you certainly ought to buy it as an intern now that you're making money. Your most valuable asset is your ability to turn your time into money at a very high rate. And if something happens to you and you become disabled, as happens to lots of docs, including residents, you will be very grateful that you protected at least some of that income with a good own occupation, specialty specific disability insurance policy. Now your residency program may offer some sort of disability insurance policy and it might be fine to use, but even if they offer you one, you should at least compare it to what you can buy on the open disability insurance market. And we recommend uh, insurance agents at the whitecoatinvestor.com, people that have been vetted by the WCI community. I suggest you meet with them and compare the program your residency pro the the policy your residency program is offering you with what you can buy in an individual policy. Not only does the individual policy go with you when you leave residency, but it is generally has a better definition of disability than you're going to get from a group policy. Plus, it usually has level premiums, and so they don't go up for the next 20 or 30 years while you're paying them, which is not the case with most group policies. So generally, you want to buy as much as they'll sell you during residency. That's typically a $5,000 per month benefit. If anyone else depends on your income, you also need to buy term life insurance. This should probably be a seven-figure amount. The good news is it's much cheaper than disability insurance. When you shop for disability insurance, you might get a little bit of sticker shock. That's probably not going to happen with life insurance. You can buy, you know, if you are uh, a healthy woman in your late 20s, you can buy a million dollars of term life insurance for only like $500 a year. It's super cheap. Um, okay, you should also pick up personal liability insurance, not just the minimum amount your state requires on your auto policy. Jack that up probably to two hundred dollars or $300,000 and then stack a seven-figure umbrella policy on top of it. It's very cheap. It's way cheaper than malpractice. It might only cost you $200 a year to get an umbrella policy that covers a million dollars in personal liability. Super cheap, but make sure you get it. Okay, make a budget. You're now making money, right? You need to learn to live on it. Those lessons that you learn as a resident are gonna pay huge dividends as you become an attending. You'll develop all the habits you need to develop to be financially successful once you're making the big bucks. Besides, don't be one of those residents like, oh, I can't live on a resident salary. It's only $60,000 or $70,000. Guess what? The average American household income is sixty or seventy thousand dollars? That's what residents make. So if you can't live on that, you really need to look at what you're spending. Okay, because there are half of America is living on less than you're making. So you can do it too. And I also encourage people to start saving some money during residency. Uh, I tell attendings they need to save twenty percent of their gross income for retirement. I don't tell residents that, but it's good if you can save something. If your employer's four hundred one k or four hundred three b offers a match, make sure you get that. And as a general rule in residency, you want to use Roth accounts or tax-free accounts. I put an asterisk on that because it's possible if you're going for public service loan forgiveness that you'll actually get more money forgiven if you use tax-deferred accounts even during residency. There's a cost to that. You're probably going to take that money out at a higher tax rate layer than when you put the money in. So as a general rule, Roth is the right account to use during uh uh, you know, residency, but if you are really going for public service loan forgiveness, you might want to run the numbers both ways. Okay, do you need a financial advisor? Well, 80% of docs probably want one and need one, and it's okay to use one. Just make sure you're paying a fair price. A fair price is a four figure amount per year. Okay, if you're paying more than $10,000 a year, I promise I, I can find you somebody that is giving better advice uh, at a cheaper price. Um, but it's okay to do your own financial plan and investment management. As I mentioned earlier, it's one of the best paying hobbies that there is, but you actually do have to do it right. And you probably have to be somewhat interested in this stuff because you got to pay attention to it. 
If you just need help paying, figuring out your student loans, you can go to studentloanadvice.com and get advice relatively inexpensively for just that part of your financial plan. Okay, so a simple investing plan is not that complicated, okay? And it works fine. So here's a plan that'll get you through residency, all right? Use Roth accounts for the most part and just stick everything into target retirement funds, okay? Those are broadly diversified index funds. They are low cost. They automatically rebalance. They are truly a set it and forget it investment strategy. Your asset allocation, frankly, doesn't even matter that much in the beginning. It's all about how much money you're putting into the account. Don't mistake investing for gambling. It is not gambling, okay? You're investing in something that is almost guaranteed to be worth dramatically more in 20 or 30 funds, in 20 or 30 years. But that is not the case if you get into some of these more speculative types of investments, types of crypto assets. Um, you know, Tesla stock was a big one a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, ARC funds were all the rage. Everyone was investing in ARC funds. Very interesting study. You can see what happened to those over the last couple of years. You know, Robinhood tries to gamify investing. When you buy a stock or sell a stock, you know, balloons and confetti come up. That's not what we're talking about. You're not looking for your dopamine rush when you invest. You're looking for a smart, long-term strategy to build wealth. So that means that uh, visiting something like the Wall Street Bets subreddit, as uh, as was recently uh, you know made popular in the movie called Dumb Money, is uh, for your entertainment, not for actually getting investment advice. Okay, so what have we learned tonight? We've learned that you need to become financially literate, that it's your second job, that you need to assume that everything you buy costs three times the sticker price, Remember to consider your cost of living when choosing your residency and choose especially carefully. Have a written plan for managing your student loans. Be careful renting a, to not buy a home during residency unless you really don't have another option. Renting is almost always the default choice. When we've learned that you need to hit the ground running with a solid financial plan as you receive your first paycheck. All right. Uh, if we don't get to your question tonight, you can email me at editor at whitecoatinvestor.com. You can email Andrew, Andrew at studentloanadvice.com. Come by the website, whitecoatinvestor.com. Um, you can also check out our podcast and our YouTube channel if you prefer to learn in that manner. And we have a number of communities set up where you can also ask questions. There's a WCI forum you can get to right off the main web page. We have a subreddit if you prefer that format. If you like Facebook, we have a private Facebook group. And we even have a group that is all women. It's called the Financially Empowered Women or the Few. All right. So just type your questions into the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as we can. All right. Uh, looks like this one about our champions. Pro. Oh, somebody's who's handling these. Are you doing these, Andrew? Or is uh, yeah. Lauren doing Yeah, I got them. All right. Uh, Sounds like this one's for me. Jim says, I'm a current MS1. I'm thinking about creating an investor policy statement to prepare for my future. What tips do you have for those who are interested in making one? All right. Well, first of all, an investing policy statement or a written investing plan is simply a description of how you're going to invest throughout your life. It typically dictates an asset allocation or mix of investments in which you're going to invest. It also describes your investing behavior, such as I won't sell stocks in the midst of a bear market. Um, so I've got a number of blog posts on how to create an investing policy statement on the website. But honestly, man, if you're thinking about this as an MS1, you are going to win so much with money. You're probably six or seven years away from really needing a, a written investing plan. But this is great that you're thinking about it already. Hopefully you've actually got some money to invest. But if you're like most medical students, you're still uh, borrowing money for your living expenses, not thinking about investing. But the main tips I have for you are, you know, make it written. Um, you know, you can even post parts of it onto forums like the WCI forum or the Bogleheads forum and get some feedback on it. Um, and uh, basically, you just want something that you can follow to investing success. All right, what's our next question? This is from Seth. Hey, Jim and Andrew, I appreciate what you do. I'm planning to go into my gap year before medical school with a very high chance of being accepted at my state school. And 
during my gap year, I'll be able to work a decent amount, hoping to make over 30K, supporting my wife while she finishes her BSN degree. Regarding the impending loans, which I anticipate to be at least $140,000 cost to tuition, what should I look into doing during my gap year to use to best use my income? Okay, well, um, it depends. You know, I don't know that we have enough information from you, Seth. For example, if you told me you had a bunch of uh, credit card debt at 28%, I'd say use your income to pay that sort of a thing down. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you really don't have anything like that, no better use for your money, I'd start piling up the cash. I'd put it in a high yield savings account or a money market fund at Vanguard. And I'd just pile it up as high as you can in anticipation of using it to pay for the costs of medical school in a year or two. Um, you're expecting to borrow at least $140,000. Well, maybe you can save up $15,000 and you only have to borrow 125. Um, you know, and uh, the nice thing about having some cash going in is you tend to use that first. And so you eliminate those loans from your first year or your first semester and uh, minimizing the amount of time that uh, compound interest can work on those uh, on the student loan debts. Um, OK, you had a, a follow up question as well. Also, during medical school, would it be smart to use my wife's income to cover tuition? or start paying loans off with the student loan interest rates of 8%, it would seem that it would be a better ROI. And I guess I can take this one, Jim. So it sounds like you're going to borrow relatively less than what your peers are. If you were going to be borrowing $300,000 or $350,000, I, I would say, you know, maybe you should be taking those federal student loans and see how things shake out when you go through residency and then you're working as an attending doc. But I would just try to cash flow whatever you could up front and minimize the loan burden. And then sounds like, you know, you're going to be coming out maybe in the six figure range overall, and then should be able to tackle this stuff really aggressively when you graduate training. I think you might be saying that he already has some loans from undergraduate. In, in which case, you've got a question, right? Do you pile up cash to save, you know, loan, taking out loans at 7 or 8% in medical school um, and not pay off those 3 or 4% loans you have from undergraduate? Uh, I don't know. That's a bit of a judgment call. That's a hard decision to make. Um, I probably would not, in just a single gap year, go crazy paying off your undergraduate loans. Seems silly to, to pay off 4% loans and then turn around and borrow at 8%. I think I'd probably pile it up in cash right now and you'll make 5% on that right now anyway. Yeah. Okay, this is from Gavin Christensen. How should one prioritize paying off student loans, investing and taking on more positive debt in the first few years as an attending? Okay. Well, this question's at least uh, three or four years out for most of you, but this is something that all new attendings deal with. You come out, you're finally making the big money, but you realize you have all these great uses for that money. And in fact, you have more great uses for money than you actually have money. You know, you got to start making payments on student loans. You want to pay those off quickly. Maybe you want to save up a down payment for a house. You need to beef up your emergency fund. Maybe you got some credit card debt you're paying off or a car loan you've got to get paid off. You want to max out your retirement accounts. Maybe you're now have an HSA you're eligible for. You have all these great uses for money. And you just have to decide what your priorities are. You know, I tell people that are paying off their student loans, not going for PSLF, that you probably want to be rid of your student loans within five years. Some people just hate debt. They want it gone in two. Other people stretch it out the full five years. I think that's fine. Either approach, um, you know, if you want to prioritize investing a little more, maybe you pay off your student loans in five years instead of two. Um, and uh, But the real key, the real secret when you come out of your residency is to keep your lifestyle down. Keep it something similar to what you had as a resident. So if you were living on $60,000 as a resident, you can live on $60,000 as an attending for a year or two or three. And if you can do that, if you can live on $60,000 and you can earn two or three or 400 or $500,000, there's a huge delta there. 
And you can use the difference. Even after paying this new higher tax bill you're going to have, you can use that difference to wipe out an awful lot of student loan debt very quickly to max out retirement accounts and catch up to your college roommates when it comes to saving up a retirement nest egg and so forth. Now, sometimes you do have to take on some more debt then. You know, a mortgage is usually a reasonable thing to do. Just make sure it's an affordable amount. Maybe you need to buy into a practice or you want to buy into your share of a surgical center or a radiology center or, you know, buy your own practice if you're a dentist. Those are reasonable things to borrow for. But try to have some money to put down and try to get the best terms possible. All right. Here's another question. Thoughts about doing PSLF and just doing save versus paying off the loan in three to four years and trying to increase salary or investment while working in PSLF eligible workplaces. So I can take this one, Jim. You know, I I think when you're doing, if you're going to work at a job that qualifies For public service loan forgiveness after training, you should 100% run the numbers. And I had kind of depicted a situation earlier on in the presentation where an emergency medicine doctor was going to pay like $130,000 over a decade with PSLF versus getting on a standard repayment schedule over a decade, and they're paying about $400,000. And again, that was on a student loan balance of $300,000. That may be more than you owe. But... If you are at a job that qualifies, you should definitely look at PSLF. And even if you're making a, you know, you're trying to find ways to optimize your income or have a side hustle or whatever, that's okay. You can still qualify for PSLF, but know that the name of the game when you're doing loan forgiveness is to pay the least amount towards your student loans. Bring down that AGI through, you know, pre-tax contribution. Maybe it's married filing separately if you're if you're married to another earner. And then that other, you know, that excess cash that can be going into savings or you know, five twenty nine plans for your kids. There's a whole lot of other options that are at your disposal. So would encourage you to, you know, pay the minimum if you're doing PSLF. Yeah, I think this is, you know, a lot more clear cut than most people think it is. It basically comes down to your job. When you're coming out of residency, get the job you want. If that job qualifies for PSLF, go for PSLF. If it doesn't qualify for PSLF and you have some reasonable amount of debt, not $600,000 for a job that makes 150 or something like that, refinance it and pay it off. It's really pretty simple for most people. I think if you're going to a job that qualifies for PSLF and think about paying off your loans just to be done, you know, a couple of years sooner, I think that's probably a mistake. Likewise, if you are letting the student loan tail wag the job dog, you're probably making a mistake. If you're going to a job where you're going to be miserable just because it qualifies for PSLF, you better make sure you're going to get an awful lot of money forgiven to make up for that. Uh, In my experience, PSLF qualifying jobs don't necessarily pay all that much less than a non-PSLF qualifying job. A lot of times they pay about the same or even more. So don't assume that a job's terrible just because it qualifies for PSLF. But in many areas and many specialties, there just aren't any PSLF qualifying jobs. Here in Utah for emergency doctors, the only PSLF qualifying job is up at the university. There are no others. The docs that work at the VA, they contract via a private group. That doesn't qualify for PSLF, at least not outside of, you know, a couple of states, neither of which is Utah. And, uh, you know, there's a big nonprofit hospital system here in Utah called IHC. But guess what? The emergency docs who staff those EDs, they're part of a private group. That doesn't qualify for PSLF. And so depending on what you're doing, PSLF might not be an option. So recognize that. And, uh, and make sure that uh, you choose the right thing for you as you're coming out of your training. Mm-hmm. All right. Next question. This one comes from Jaxty105. And so I'm a, this is why consolidate? And I think they're talking about the portion where we were talking about direct federal consolidation And so why should someone consolidate? Well, when you finish medical or dental school in May or in in June, 
the loans are placed into a temporary status that's called grace period. And it's this runway where you don't have to make payments and, you know, you can get moved. And it's just this, this added level of a break before you have to start making payments. But the unfortunate part about this grace period is that your loans start to grow. They're accruing interest. And if you're doing PSLF, the clock is not going to start when you begin working. And if you're doing forgiveness, you want to get out of that grace period. And the only way to do that is through a direct federal consolidation, which allows you, instead of moving in repayment in November or December that year, to begin in June or July. That is massive. Because think about it. If you're going to do loan forgiveness, you know, PSLF, you're, you may have $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 monthly payments when you're working as an attending. Wouldn't it be helpful if you were able to capture as many payments of those lower income years. And that's what you can do if you consolidate because you can start making payments in June or July. So I think it's important. Let's take one step back here, Andrew, because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between consolidating and refinancing. You want to explain the difference between those two? Yeah. So consolidation or what we refer to as a direct federal consolidation is taking your federal loans and it's lumping them into one federal loan, but it stays federal, stays within the federal system. Now, there's also private refinancing, which is commonly mixed in with consolidation, and that is converting or, or it's taking a federal loan or a private loan or you know a multi- multiple loans and it's converting them into a private loan. And this is something that you know many out there will do, but please, please be wary if you're looking to consolidate that if you do this private consolidation, you're no longer a candidate for IDR, for PSLF. So just be absolutely crystal clear on, on what kind of a consolidation you're dealing with. Yeah. So the benefits of consolidation is instead of having eight loans to keep track of, now you've only got one. Yep. And you may be able to start that clock a little sooner if you're if you're trying to knock out 120 monthly payments to get public service loan forgiveness. The benefit, but you don't get a lower interest rate. In fact, your interest rate is the average of what the interest rates were before, often plus a little bit, rounded up to the next mm-hmm. eighth of a point. Whereas when you refinance, the benefit is you get a lower interest rate which is a big deal if you're actually planning to pay off your student loans. So make sure you understand the difference between consolidation and refinancing. Okay, this is from Gavin Christensen. What are your thoughts on borrowing majority graduate plus loans in order to enroll and save and prevent interest accrual while in school? So the 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 key here gavin is that they don't let you just take the graduate plus loans there's two buckets of loans that you borrow 40,500 is the first bucket and if you borrow more than that for for the year you dip into direct plus graduate the plus graduate loans are kind of a killer. They're a 1% higher interest rate than the Stafford unsubsidized. So like Stafford unsubsidized right now, they're like seven and a quarter. So that means if you're borrowing Stafford unsubsidized and you're taking out more than $40,000 a year, which is very common for medical and dental school, and you're dipping into direct plus graduate, that's at eight and a quarter. So yes, I understand that it would be nice if you could get all the loans into repayment while you're in school so you could start collecting subsidy, but know that it's just not going to be feasible to do that. But there, there can be some of this benefit in rolling into save on those direct plus graduate loans, because that could be if you borrow 400 grand, you know, 200 of that could be plus graduate, right? So you could still be, you know, benefiting greatly $10,000, $20,000 in interest you know, over a couple of years while you're in school. But you can't just borrow the grad plus loans. You've, you've, Correct. Got, you've got to take the unsubsidized ones, uh, yep. Stafford's first. You know, I, I love these questions, man. Moral hazard, moral hazard. <laughs> yes. if we set up the student loan federal program this way that people actually think about stuff like this, thinking about taking a higher interest rate student loan just to try to get some of these benefits, you know? And it's, and it's because the effective rate on those plus loans can be like zero while right. you're in school. If you right. got a $0 payment, right. Is, is, is the crazy thing. Yeah. And so you're, you're right. Moral hazard. Yep. 
Okay, this is from Adrian Cavender for an MS4 done with disbursements. Would there be any downside to consolidating loans now and entering into save before graduation? Seems like a way to quit accruing interest sooner on 0% monthly payment or zero dollar monthly payments. So this point here, you can't consolidate your loans while you're still in school. They're not going to let you do that. And it's because when your loans are in deferment, when you're in school, they don't allow for this. You actually have to wait until your loans are in grace period. And there's actually like a manual process that has to be done where your school communicates this to the loan servicer, but it goes to this mental middle entity that's called clearing house that effectively would move your loans from in school to out of school status. And so until the loans are in out of school status or in grace period, they, they just, they won't let you consolidate. Otherwise I'd be telling those of you that are graduating this year to get, get started on your consolidation now, federal consolidation that is, so that you can start your payments right there when you begin your intern year in June or July. So Andrew, what's the fastest you've seen somebody, t- the shortest period of time from graduation until uh, they can actually consolidate? So I tell most, yeah. it, I tell most people, Jim, to call their school's financial aid office. If you graduate on Friday or a Saturday, call them on Monday and say, I want my loans to get moved from in-school status to out of school. It usually takes about a week or two of processing on their end, and then they can do the consolidation. But then the consolidation, it takes a month, right? So it's key to try to get this ball rolling as soon as you graduate so that when you begin July 1st or June 20th, whatever it is, you're, you're in repayment as soon as possible. Yeah. But, it, but it's not going to be the day after you graduate. Unfortunately, no. Okay. This is from Ms. Breadstick. Will filing jointly third year of medical school and separately fourth year affect student loan payments? My understanding is the lower my income appears fourth year, the lower my mandatory payment will be. Well, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the third year doesn't really matter, but the fourth year does, right? Because let's suppose your partner, you're married and they make $100,000 and you're making zero, if you file jointly in your MS4 year, well, your payments when you start your intern year are going to be based on that income of $100,000, which could be like a $700, $800 monthly payment. That could be a lot of money you know, to pay while you're in in training and making a $4,000 paycheck. So that's where married filing separately could be massive because instead of making a payment of $800, $900 per month, you could have a $0 payment. For an entire year. Yeah, I think it's important that people understand what we're talking about here. This is the tax return you file in the last half of your MS4 year, but it covers the calendar year that includes the last half of your third year and the first half of your fourth year. That's the tax return we're talking about. And remember that there's usually a downside to filing married, filing separately. You usually end up paying a little bit more in tax. So you've got to run the numbers. Yes, you'll have a lower IDR payment, but you might also have a higher tax bill. So in some families, it might not make sense to do that. You've really got to run the numbers and compare. And if you need help doing that, book an appointment with Andrew and he can help you run the numbers. DJ Learning. Hello. Can you only have direct plus graduate loans to be placed? Or if I take out both unsubsidized and graduate plus than both have going into repayment. While you're in school, you can only have the direct plus graduate loans go into repayment. They're not gonna let you move the direct Stafford unsubsidized loans into repayment. Those would have to be put into repayment after you graduate from medical or dental school. But you can split them. You can have some of your loans in repayment and some of them still deferred. Correct. All right. This is coming from Michael Mazur. I'm a fourth year medical student and wondering if my wife and I should file our taxes separately this year or wait until next year in anticipation of the income-based repayment plans for my loans. And Jim, I think you had just answered this question, but it depends. Are you trying to make the minimum payments? 
right? Are you a candidate for public service loan forgiveness? Do you owe $50,000 in student loans? Because if you do, it probably not, doesn't make sense to file separately. But if you're considering forgiveness or if you've got mortgage sized student loans, 200, 300, $400,000, you know, maybe you start with that because if you file separately, it could give you lower payments, but you do need to incorporate the additional tax cost. Because if you have a partner who's making good money already, like I was just working with a couple yesterday and uh, the spouse, one of them was already working as an attending, making $400,000 a year. And their partner was just graduating medical school and they were going to take a 15 or $20,000 tax hit to file separately. So definitely something to look at from a tax standpoint and, and student loans. Okay. Yeah. So DJ learning again, MS3. Do both of these have to go into repayment or just the graduate plus loans? Once I commit to the save program, you can all, it would just be the direct plus graduate loans while you're in school would be eligible for repayment. The Stafford unsubsidized don't. And then after you graduate, you could get all of them onto the same repayment program. But now those payments you made in med school, they count toward your 120 though, right? Well, if you're working full time, if you're working 30 hours per That's week right. at a non That's profit. Right. Good point. Right? Good point. They wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't count because you're not a full-time employee. Good point. And and this is, and this is really the follow-up there is I have a part-time job of the W2. Do these payments count? Right. If it's 30 hours per week and you're working at a non for profit or 501c3, absolutely. If it's if you're working for Scribe for America or you're working, you know, 20 hours a week as a, as a research assistant, not, not gonna cut it. You gotta be a minimum of 30 hours per week. Okay. This is from Brian Hukari. I'm a fourth year student. My wife's a PGY3 on the SAVE program. Will her salary contribute to my loan payments if we file jointly? We do utilize a Roth IRA for her. Better option to file separately or jointly. Ryan, I don't know enough to understand if, if it's a better option for you to file separately or jointly. Does How much does she owe? Is she doing PSLF or is she just in the SAVE program right now and she's going to refinance when rates are better? I don't, I don't know, but her, her income does contribute to your payments if you file jointly. But the way they look at it, if you both have federal student loans, is they prorate it, where if you have a payment, let's suppose it's $1,000 a month, and you both owe $200,000 in student loans, that payment is going to be split evenly between the two of you, 500 to hers, 500 to yours, even if she's making more than you, right? So this is very, very case by case in terms of what your objective is. Is your objective forgiveness through PSLF or is your objective to just pay these off aggressively? Because I think the way you file your taxes early on doesn't really matter if you're just gonna pay these all off, so. You know, Brian, this is this is the reason we started studentloanadvice.com <laughs> is because I ran into doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor with a question like this. And, and I couldn't answer the question in 30 seconds. I couldn't do it by email. It takes sitting down with somebody, sharing your numbers, putting them into a calculator, using a spreadsheet to figure out what the right thing to do is. And now this is what Andrew does all day long, all night long too, back in October and November and December <laughs> when he was working about 80 hours a week trying to help everybody as, as student uh, loans came off, uh, came off the student loan holiday. But this is literally why we started studentloanadvice.com is because there is no easy answer to these questions. You have to run the numbers. Most people aren't capable of doing it themselves. So, so that's why we started this other company, just to help you do that for one flat fee. This is comes in from Shreetha. Uh, what is a good interest rate for private student loans below which you would not attempt to refinance? I, I don't know if there is a rate low enough that I wouldn't attempt it. <laughs> um, but right now, what do you, what do you see in people getting that are applying? I think that's really what. Oh, uh, I mean, it's five to six and a half percent. 
So I am seeing some that have federal loans refinance. If they're in the seven and a half or 8% interest rate range and they're positive, they're not doing forgiveness, I will see them private refinance, but it's still pretty, pretty few compared to two or three years ago when it was one or 2% to refinance. But if you've got private student loans, like I was just talking to a client last week, she had 18% private student loans. A lot of people don't know that private loans have variable interest rates and rates have gone up 4% the last two years, right? So if you've got private student loans and they're double digit or they're seven, they're eight or nine, 10%, you should definitely look into refinancing because now when you're coming out of school and you're working as a resident, you've got a better credit situation. Or when, you know, maybe you got married to another high earner and that, that could help. So, you know, five to six and a half percent is what we're seeing today. Yeah, there's a, and you can refinance into variable rate loans. You can refinance into fixed rate loans. You know, a lot of people refinanced a few years ago, they refinanced into a variable loan that was charging 2% and then the rate fell. And they found themselves paying 1% or less than 1%. So if you really think interest rates are going to fall, you might consider uh, a variable rate loan. You might find yourself automatically paying less over time. Okay, Jim, this is from Kavita S. Can you speak to a diversified portfolio? What does that mean? Okay, I think there's two important concepts to understand when it comes to, to diversified portfolio. The first is between asset classes. Now, an asset class is a type of investment. For example, the big asset classes are things like stocks, bonds, real estate. By having all of those in your portfolio, it helps you to be diversified. You're still doing okay when stocks are doing bad because maybe bonds and real estate are doing well. If it's like uh, last year, uh, 2020, 2023, uh, you know, stocks and bonds did well, real estate, not so much. The year before that, you know, real estate did pretty well, Stocks and bonds, not so much. And so that's inter-asset class diversification. Within a given asset class, within your stocks, you also want to be diversified by having a lot of them. So if one company goes bankrupt or one company, you know, the price of the stock falls from $800 to $70, it, it doesn't end up hurting your overall portfolio because you own thousands of them. And so the way I invest in stocks is using index mutual funds. For example, a total stock market index fund owns 4,000 different stocks. So if one or two of them go bankrupt, that's not going to affect your return. So that's intra-asset class diversification, but you also want the inter-asset class diversification. This comes in from Trevin Ball. Dr. Dolly, I'm a Navy HPSP student, single. Should I get disability insurance right now? About to start my third year clinical rotation soon. Yeah, so this can be a complicated situation when you're in the military. For the most part, you can still get disability insurance even though you're going into the military on active duty. It will often exclude an act of war. So if you're shot on a deployment and that's the cause of your disability, it will often exclude that. But you can often still get disability insurance. Mass Mutual, I think, is the one that can do it most frequently, but work with an independent agent and they can talk to you about all of your options. Now, I like the idea of getting it before you go active duty, which you're probably going to do an active duty residency. And so you may be an exception to my general rule. You don't buy this stuff until you're an intern. It might be worth picking it up while you're still a student. Um, so I would, I would meet with somebody now and talk about your options. Again, we've got that list under our recommended tab at whitecoatinvestor.com and you can meet with an independent agent that can help you with this. All right. This one comes from Instagram thoughts on doing full-time locums straight out of residency and foregoing the employment retirement accounts and insurance. Uh, there, I know some docs that have done locums straight out of residency. Locums is basically where you're going and working someplace for six weeks or three months or six months, and then you're going somewhere else and working there. The cool thing about it is if you're doing locums all the time, they usually pay your lodging and your transportation. And sometimes they'll give you a, you know, pay for a rental car. Well, you can sell your car. You can sell your house or not buy a house and just live on what they're providing. So it's possible to cut your expenses to almost nothing doing this. And almost everything you make goes toward paying off student loans and building wealth 
and that sort of a thing. So this can be a really good strategy for some people. If you'll recall the uh, founder of the Physician on Fire website, it's now under different ownership, but the founder of it is a fellow by the name of Leif Dahlin. He did this for four or five years out of residency. He just worked locums. That's all he did. And they saved almost everything. And he ended up being financially independent before he became 40 even. But this idea of foregoing employer retirement accounts and insurance, that's not a big deal. You can buy that stuff yourself, right? You can set up your own uh, solo 401k. You can set up your own solo cash balance plan. And you can buy your own insurance on the open market. You know, people talk about the, like it's impossible to get insurance without being an employee. I've been paying for my own insurance since 2010. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, now I pay for it for a bunch of other people who work here at White Coat Investor. You can go out and buy this stuff. You just go to a health insurance broker and buy it. Yeah, it's kind of expensive stuff, but it's expensive whether you're paying for it directly or whether your employer is paying you less so that your employer can buy this stuff for you. Um, you know, so I wouldn't I wouldn't let worries about retirement accounts or worries about health insurance keep you from going and doing locums if that's what you want to do. All right. This comes from Alex Fishburn. Did you say that to use the save plan during school, only the direct plus graduate loans are eligible? Yes, we did. All right. And the reason why is I think we've answered this a couple of times, but save allows you if if you're not if your payment is not enough to cover the interest, it covers that, right? Thousand dollars of interest a month. If you got a zero dollar payment, that one thousand dollars is waived, and it's only eligible on those plus graduate loans while in school, and becomes an option for all your loans when you graduate. I think it's maybe time we do a blog post on that subject. I think I that, that's, a, that's a little pearl that not enough people know. Stay tuned, everyone. Maybe it's coming soon. <laughs> all right. This one comes from Instagram. Can you explain the flow of your money in terms of? 401k Roth and index funds. Yeah, I think the best way to explain this is the luggage analogy. Okay. There are accounts and there are investments. Okay. Uh, an account is like a piece of luggage, right? Uh, we're talking a, a duffel bag, a backpack, a suitcase, uh, a carry on, right? And an investment is like clothing, it's a, a suit, it's a um, swim trunks, it's, uh, you know, running shorts, whatever. Any type of clothing can go into any type of luggage, just like any type of investment can go into any type of an account. So the accounts are things like a 401k or a Roth IRA or a 529 education savings account or an HSA health savings accounts. Those are all accounts. Within those accounts, you have to select investments. And the investments I recommend you use for the most part in your portfolio are index mutual funds. So you would open a Roth IRA at say Vanguard or Fidelity, and you would then buy an investment within that Roth IRA called the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, if that makes sense. Okay, here's another one from Instagram for you, Jim. Do you have a specific number to put on the side for emergency funds? Yeah, the classic idea of an emergency fund is three to six months of your expenses. So if you as a resident are spending $3,000 a month, you would need something between $9,000 and $18,000 as an emergency fund. A uh, pretty typical resident emergency fund is ten grand, and the nice thing about that is it's money that you can use to pay for an expensive auto repair, or to fly you and your partner across the country for grandma's funeral, or you know if the refrigerator breaks, you can buy a new one. Um, you know, assuming you're not renting, which you probably should be, but it gives you the money to pay for things without having to borrow, without having to use a credit card for credit. And uh, so that's what an emergency fund is, you know, but any emergency funds better than no emergency fund, even a thousand dollars in it is better than having nothing. From Nabajit Das, what advice do you have for MD PhD students in terms of home buying and investing? Well, the thing about an MD, PhD student is you're going to be there for a while. So that gets you over the hump, the five-year hump where you're likely to actually make money on owning a home. 
The problem is you don't make that much money, right? Your stipend as a PhD, as an MD PhD, probably isn't that much. It might only be one or $2,000 a month. You're not going to qualify for much of a loan as far as buying a home goes. And so all of a sudden now you're talking to your parents and trying to get them to co-sign on a loan, which is usually a bad idea for them. And, uh, you know, all of your money is going toward this mortgage payment. So in general, you know, I still don't think most students ought to be buying a home, but it can make sense the longer you're in it, right? If you're doing a five-year general surgery residency, you have a much better chance of actually making money owning a home than you do in a three-year family practice residency. Uh, if you know you're going to stay in the city of your residency when you leave residency and you can stay in the same home, well, you may be able to be there for five or six or seven years and actually you know, have a good chance of making money on it. Um, but uh, you know, as a student, you just don't have the cash flow. You don't have the time. It's probably still a bad idea as a student. As far as investing, wow, you must be living really frugally if you can invest while you're in an MD PhD program. I mean, those stipends don't pay that much. Uh, if you can live on less than that and invest something, more power to you. I encourage you to do it. You probably ought to be doing it in a Roth account um, since you're probably not going for any sort of PSLF anyway. Uh, you can just keep it real simple using a target retirement fund or a total stock market index fund and, uh, and get back to your studies. All right. Another one from DJ Learning. My wife is going to match this year and her residency is six years. I'm looking at save married filing jointly or repay married filing jointly. What would be the best way to reduce interest on loans? Well, the repay program is no more. Repay went away last year. If you're still in repay, you're not anymore. It's now called save. Okay, repay was phased out for this newer save repayment program. And I would think if she is doing an extended training period, a six year residency, save is, is probably the best, the best option here if you're trying to keep your interest down because it helps to cover the interest while you're in training and while income is low as compared to the others like income-based repayment and pay that they can also offer affordable payments, but they don't have that interest subsidy. Yeah. I mean, if you're asking save married filing jointly versus pay married filing single, that's a complicated question. That's going to take you and Andrew an hour to figure out. So, uh, you know, if that's the question you're asking or meant to ask, then uh, it's probably time to book an appointment. All right. Well, let's take another question from Instagram. A student or resident is married to another physician. Should you file taxes separately or together in context of save PSLF? So I think I want to reiterate what we've been saying for, for a little while now is it really depends on, on your situation. Is the in-game PSLF? Is your in-game living like a resident for a few years and just paying these off aggressively? You know, are you on the fence with what kind of a job you're going to take after training? Because those are the sorts of situations we see as well. Someone's on the fence with PSLF. They've got two great job options and one of them is going to work out with PSLF and one of them is not. So I think generally rule of thumb is save is probably a good idea when you're in training and keeping your payments low could could help you out, which which probably entails mar married filing separately if if your spouse who's perhaps later on in their career or done with training doesn't have any loans. So now, now this was one of the upgrades of repay when it became save, right? That you can actually do the married filing separately thing. You didn't used to be able to do that with repay. You had to be in the pay plan in order to do married filing separately. Yeah, exactly. And that was a big issue was a lot of sometimes people couldn't get into sit, get into the pay program, right? Because they made too much. They didn't qualify for that partial financial hardship wherein they were making, you know, more than they owed <laughs> and they were trying to get into pay because the pay program and the income based repayment program have payment ceilings wherein the payment really won't go above much more than about 1% of your student loan debt size. 
But but now with the SAFE program allowing you to file separately, that can be a great, great avenue. But please note that the SAFE program also does not have a payment ceiling. Pay, you know, sky's the limit. I was looking at numbers earlier today with a client. She was going to have a $14,000 monthly payment in the SAFE program. Okay, you can probably try to do the math in your head on that, what, what she and her spouse were making, but but with pay and IBR, they have a payment ceiling. And sometimes that can be a better option for you should you pursue forgiveness after you graduate training. Okay, this is coming from Tiffany Chin. I'll be starting DO school this summer. And I'm currently a physical therapist with $60,000 saved up. What do you advise for taking out loans versus doing something else with this money? Uh, the moral hazard question. <laughs> this is the moral hazard introduced by public service loan forgiveness, right? Because if you're going to get all your student loans forgiven, well, then maybe you want to just invest this money, right? Uh, instead of using it to pay for school. But I'll be honest here. You're going to DO school. DO school is usually a little bit more expensive than MD school. Most people going to DO school these days, if they're borrowing the whole sum of it, um, they're not only taking out uh, federal loans, but they're also taking out private loans in addition to it. And uh, so maybe that $60,000 can keep you from taking out private loans if you spread it out over you know two or three or four years. Um, so I'd look into that. And uh, uh, the, uh, another alternative is would be use it to pay for your first year. You know, so you're only borrowing money for the second, third and fourth year. I'd probably lean toward doing one of those two things rather than just investing it and borrowing every dollar that you're going to take to go to medical school. But, um, you know, there's there's debate here. This is a controversial topic. And uh, and the reason why is because PSLF has become so generous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing I'm curious, does she have loans from PT school? Because if she's got loans from PT school and let's say she's been working for four years in public service, and she still has those loans from PT school, she can consolidate those with her loans that she's taken out for medical school. And what you can do is you can backdate your payment history on your medical school loans to when you started making payments on those PT loans. So like I'm seeing some crazy examples right now where, where borrowers, they're, they're starting medical school. They've already got four years of payment history. So they only have to work six years. So that's even more to this moral hazard, Jim. Right, right. It's then, like, then they might spend you, all that time in residency or fellowship. Right. It, it, exactly. So it's so then in that predicament, they're they're working in general surgery and then they do a fellowship year and, and they do six years of training and they never even have to make a payment based on attending income. Right. So if you borrowed before you went to medical school and it's federal, this is this is where should you cash flow that first year with the 60,000? I don't know. <laughs> Makes it harder. So. Yeah. It's like these people that came out of. uh came out of medical school in 2014, right? And did a long training period. They came out of their training period around 2020 and bam, student loan holiday for three and a half years. And in 2023 or 2024, they got PSLF and they ended up paying less than $10,000 total toward their $400,000 in student loans forgiven. I mean, it's just been wild what people have gotten forgiven uh, via you know some of these unique niches. Mm -hmm. Hard, hard to say it's good government policy, but boy, I'd, I'd sure take advantage of it if I qualified. Yep. All right. So here's a question from Kyron Maynard. We've been able to save $200,000 during undergrad. I currently have another 50000 diversified in syndications and a little in stocks. We have put all of it into a stock, into a money market. Do you advise we pay for student loans with all of our savings or use our savings for some other investment? Yeah, it's basically the same question we just had. It's a moral hazard question, right? How much do you want to bet on PSLF being your student loan plan? And, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a, a pretty good bet, but it's not 100 percent. Right. You might not match. You might, um, you might end up uh, not wanting to work for a 501c3. Um, you know, you might become disabled or you might change your career plans. There's, 
you know, something might happen to the program and you're not grandfathered in. There's a lot of risk there. I think I would probably lean toward using the money you have to pay for medical school. I know it sounds fuddy-duddy and traditional, but that's probably what I would do. You have the money, pay for medical school, come out without the pressure of of student loans or feeling like you have to work full time for 10 years to pay for these things. And, uh, and that's why we have money is to make our lives easier. You have money, make your life easier. Don't borrow a bunch of money. All right. From Ezra Fagbemi, which of the index funds is best to invest in? Oh, well, let me look at my crystal ball here and see what future returns are going to be. I mean, without knowing the future, it's impossible to answer this question. But as a general rule, you want a broadly diversified index mutual fund. Low cost, broadly diversified, that's what you're looking for. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the ones from Vanguard. We're talking about some of those from Fidelity. We're talking about iShares ETFs. We're talking about State Street ETFs. These are spiders. There are some low cost Schwab index funds. Basically, look at the expense ratio of the fund. If it's less than 0.2% a year, it's probably a good index fund that you should feel pretty good about investing in. Okay, Monica Stevens, while enrolled in the SAVE program after the monthly payment and subsequent subsidized interest, can you make an additional payment counting towards principal only? Yes. In in the case where you have $1,000 of interest each month and your monthly payment is $200, you get $800 of an interest subsidy. And that takes place every single month. That's $9,600 in interest savings that year. So instead of, and what I would say is, instead of making an extra payment above that $200 each month, put it in a high yield savings account, put it in some type of savings account. And then if you're trying to take that approach where you want to just pay this all off, then you could make a lump sum payment, right? But if you're trying to make the minimum payments and save because you're doing forgiveness, you shouldn't be paying extra. But if you are going to just pay it all off, that's where you can put extra towards the loan, but you can still benefit from that subsidy. So if you pay extra, you're losing some of your subsidy is what you're saying. Well, right, because if you have a $200,000 loan balance and you pay $50,000, when they recalculate your subsidy the following year, the interest is going to be smaller on that. So little by little, that will work itself out. But on a monthly basis, that interest subsidy is fixed for an entire year, Jim. So if my payment's 200 bucks and my interest is 1000 that $800 subsidy is going to occur each month, even if I pay more than that 200 If I paid 400 200 is going to interest, 200 is going to principal. But then after that, you know, each year when they reassess your balance, then and they, and they recalculate what your payment is and and you know the effective subsidy that would go down. So at a minimum, stick it in the uh, high yield savings account or money market fund for a year, and then yeah. then send it in as a lump sum. This is assuming, of course, you're paying off your student loans. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. From Jeremy Grossman, don't all nonprofits qualify as PSLF? <laughs> and ninety seven percent of hospitals in U.S. are nonprofits. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the big nonprofit system here in Utah is Intermountain Healthcare. And guess what? The emergency docs that staff those emergency departments are not employees of the hospital. They are a private group that contracts with the hospital to provide services. Those jobs do not qualify for PSLF. So even though you work in a hospital that's a nonprofit, does not mean your job will qualify. You have to be full time, number one. Number two, you got to be directly employed by the 501c3. So yes, there's lots of PSLF qualifying jobs out there, but it is not all physician jobs. I don't know that anybody's ever done a survey of how many, what percentage of physician jobs qualify, but I would guess it's probably 40 or 50%. Yeah. And I want to throw a little spin on this, Jim. If you're in California or you're in Texas, If you're part of a physician group or some type of emergency medicine group that is contracted at a hospital, 
that doesn't qualify in every other state except in California and Texas. They just broaden the scope of the PSLF program in, in July last year, where you can be working for a private group and you can, you, you know, staff at, at a hospital and you can now qualify. But it is, there are some strict parameters there. You still got to be working the 30 hours and, and you got to get buy-in from that organization to actually sign off for you, even though they're not your actual employer, that hospital. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, now there is the, the staffing and the arrangement set up with the group or the employer that you currently have. But but something to be be mindful of is that you, maybe you would still qualify. So, yeah, this this is due to their corporate practice of medicine laws. What do you think? Look into your crystal ball here and tell us what you think the odds of that happening in other states are. I mean, they're trying, Jim, and I have seen lots and lots of doctors and they're like, well, the same organization that I'm a part of in other states now qualifies. What about me? And I'm like, there is some dilemma here, right? But I I don't feel like I'm I'm well enough versed in 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 that kind of legal space to think it's going to happen. Uh, but I mean, crazier things have occurred, right? There were no student loan payments for three and a half years. There's there's been you know, and the non payments during COVID was counting towards the PSLF track. So I mean, I'm not putting any stock in them changing that, but there's always a chance they could. Yeah, I've given up on predicting what's going to happen with federal student loan law about three years ago. <laughs> I mean, a whole bunch of people got their student loans forgiven today. Anybody who never borrowed more than $12,000, they got an email today saying their federal student loans were forgiven So, uh, and, and tax-free to boot. So who knows what's going to happen? This comes in from AJ. Some states have full tuition waivers for in-state medical schools for National Guard members. What are your thoughts on these programs? Is it doable to be in the National Guard while in school? All right. Well, the National Guard has special programs for doctors. They need doctors just like the Reserve does, just like active duty military branches do. And so they have their own specific programs. But I don't think that's what you're talking about here. I think you're talking about a special state program that basically just waives tuition if you're a current guardsman uh, or guardswoman, I guess. Um, wow. I guess my big worry is uh, the National Guard gets deployed every now and then, right? It might be two weeks a year and uh, you know, two weekends a month, maybe you could pull that off throughout most of medical school. But what if you're going into your OB rotation and they wanted to deploy you for three months? That seems like it'd be a, a major issue with your career track. Um, so I would have those conversations with the guard and uh, with the medical school of what's going to happen in those sorts of worst case scenarios before I went down this pathway. And if you're really interested in guard service, look at the National Guard programs. They do have programs that are specific toward uh, doctors and bringing doctors in. Uh, and, you know, similar to the HPSP program uh, that can help pay for medical school. And I think they can help pay up front and they can also help pay afterwards as well. Even if you're working as a, as a civilian doc, you can still look look into that. And I, I know that some docs are doing weekends on uh, the National Guard and they're, they're helping with some repayment assistance. Chloe DeMare, would it be risky to not go into an IDR plan and go into a graduated plan? for the lower monthly payment so that I can put as much money into paying off my private. I have about 50-50 federal and 50-50 private. Well, Chloe, if, if you're in school, you don't have payments on your, your private or your federal student loans. They, they usually allow you to put all of these into permit. Now, if you're talking about residency, your intern year and your PGY2 year in IDR can be virtually nothing if payments are based on your income. Because think about it. The payments on your in your intern year are based on the year prior when you were at the tail end of your third year and the first half of your fourth year when you probably didn't make anything. Your first year, $0 payments. Your second year as a resident, 
they can be based off of what you made the first six months when you were working as an intern. It was probably, I don't know what your PGY1 income is, $70,000, let's say. So it's probably about 35 grand that you made. And you might have like a $50 payment on those federal student loans. That's probably going to be less than whatever that graduated plan is. Because even the 25-year extended graduated plan can be a couple hundred bucks. It can be 300, 400, 500 dollars. So I would really just, you know, look at what both of those options are and see if it would actually be cheaper to do IDR instead of one of those 20, the 25 or the 10 year repayment plan. Andrew, I think we got to be even stronger on this one. Chloe, I think it's a terrible idea for you to go into a graduated <laughs> plan. That is awful, um, you know, for a few reasons. One, you know, you definitely want to, you never know if you're going to go for PSLF or something like that. So it's good to be in an IDR program for that. Although I think a graduated plan payment still qualifies for those, don't they, Andrew? Uh, graduated doesn't qualify for PSLF. Standard tenure does, uh-huh. but graduated doesn't. So that's another thing too. Yeah. Is you're not getting credit for PSLF if you do that. So. Yeah, which is really your follow up question. So yes, it's very risky. It's not only yeah. probably going to cost you more money, but it's going to disqualify those payments from counting for PSLF. I just think it's a bad idea all around. Go in the IDR programs. Uh, this is, you know, the truth is these IDR and PSLF programs. They are best for doctors, right? I don't know if Congress knew this when they're putting these plans in place, but these are like the greatest handout to doctors that have ever been made in the history of the country, right? Not only do you get to make these little tiny payments during residency, but you might get three or four or $500,000 forgiven. Use the programs. They're designed for you. They're perfect for you. Don't try to work some other weird graduated payment plan thing. Just go into IDR for your federal stuff refinance your private stuff, uh, you know, early and often. Morgan Swanger, can you go into the steps to make the Roth conversion? I have a retirement account from my gap year that I would like to roll over into the Roth. Okay. This is pretty easy. First, you dial the phone number to the uh, people that have your IRA, right? And you open a Roth IRA. Uh, with them. You can do it right on the phone, whether this is Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or whoever, and then ask them to move all of the money that's in the traditional IRA into the Roth IRA. And that's it. You'll probably be on the phone for 15 or 20 minutes. And that's all there is to it. You can often do it online, um, but you'll have to you know, find the place online to do it. It's called the Roth conversion. Um, if it's just a small one, like yours probably is, it's a gap year. I don't know how much money you got in there, maybe five or $10,000. So that's not going to cost you anything in taxes in one of those years in medical school when you have no income. So you can probably do it all at once. Uh, you know, as an MS2, you can just move all that money from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. But that's, that's the process. You just make a transfer from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, and then you reinvest the money in the Roth IRA. Uh, there's not much more to it. And if you need help, call them up. They'll help you do it. This is what the people on the other end of the phone do all day long. Gavin Christensen, I've heard peers enrolled in SAVE that plan to bail into different IDR plans before five years in order to be tr- to avoid being trapped in SAVE. What considerations need to be made when considering switching IDR plans? Is there merit to not wanting to be stuck in SAVE? If planning to forego PSLF and aggressively pay off loans? So this is a good question. And really, this has changed recently. It used to be if you were going to do PSLF, you get out of repay and you go into the pay program because there's a payment ceiling and it gives you the ability to file separately. Well, now SAVE has this interest subsidy that helps to keep your balance down and have generally the most affordable payments when you're in training. But that's not always the case when you're working as an attending, if your income goes to about $100,000 more than you owe. So if you're going into a high earning specialty and you only owe 200 grand and you're doing PSLF, you probably want to be an IBR or in the pay program. But this is why it gets even more tricky. The pay program is no longer allowing new entrants this year in July, okay? So if you want to get into the pay program, you got to do it now, okay? And if you can't, then you may need to look at income-based repayment. 
And there's actually two versions of income-based repayment, which we won't go into detail on now. But if you're a newer borrower, IBR is a carbon copy of save, uh, of, excuse me, pay. And the save program does not allow you to get out of it and go into the IBR plan if you've made five years of payments already. So not only is there this timing component of specific amount of years that you have to be mindful of, but there's also an income threshold as well. So if you're planning on doing PSLF, post-training, and you're going to be making more than you owe, you better make sure to get into one of those payment programs that capture payments. That's the first thing there. And then on, on the second question, if you're just planning on forgoing PSLF, why are you so worried about which IDR plan you're going to be in? It's probably save and then start making extra payments on these as soon as you can when you're in attending. Because when you're in attending, your payments are still going to be based on your resident income if you're in save. It still might be 300 bucks a month, but it doesn't make sense to pay that 300 bucks anymore. Start paying three grand, four grand, five grand, right? And, and pay these off in, in three or five years after training. Yeah. And then with a year or two out, when those payments readjust to, uh, you know, attending level payments, that's when you want to look at re refinancing and getting a lower interest rate. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> okay. This is from Dan Raymond. Thoughts on alternative asset investing? Well, it really depends on what you're calling alternatives, right? If we're talking about some sort of speculative thing, we're talking about Bitcoin, keep it to a single digit percentage of your portfolio. Uh, same thing with commodities, same thing with precious metals. And I'm not talking a single digit percentage for each of them. I'm talking a single digit percentage for all of them put together. Um, you know, hedge funds I'd put in that category. But if you're talking about, you know, real estate investing as an alternative, I think you can go to a higher percentage than that. I think that's a very legitimate investment that's build wealth for lots and lots of people. Um, so it really comes down to how you're you're talking about alternatives. Me, I pretty much just avoid all those speculative investments altogether. I only invest in stocks, bonds and real estate. That's it. Um, so those are certainly, uh, <clears throat> you know, interesting. They're fun to look at. They're fun to learn about. Um, but I don't think they're for your serious money, not a large percentage of it anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, they're fun to learn about. If you want to put a little bit of money into it, I think that's fine. But the majority of your portfolio needs to be in traditional investments, stocks, bonds, real estate. Looks like there's just a, just about two or three more questions, Jim. So this That's coming good. in, I'm amazed at the 62 people here that are still hanging on for this. We're going into, <laughs> we're like two and a half hours into this webinar and you guys are still here. We'll get all your on the East coast. <laughs> yeah. It's getting late. So thank kudos to all of you who have stuck with us this long. So if you're married filing separately for taxes, what's the general rules for contributing to Roth, traditional IRAs, 401ks? Can we still contribute but wouldn't be able to have any tax benefit. Thanks in advance. So maybe I can take a little bit of this early on right now, Jim. So I'm getting this question every day. I filed separately last year for tax for, for student loan purposes to keep my payments low. And we contributed directly to a Roth IRA. Oh, that is a big no-no, right? Like, and I'm getting this every day. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you file separately, you cannot directly contribute to a Roth IRA. You have to use backdoor Roth IRA in that case, because if you make more than 10 grand, you can't do that. And they're going to start charging you some penalties and fees. So if you're filing separately, just know if you want to do a Roth IRA, you got to do backdoor Roth IRA. Okay. So that's the first point. Can you do 401ks, Roth 401ks? Yeah, there's, there's no issue there. On, on doing that. But I know the biggest one is you got to do the backdoor author. I mean, and, and maybe you can speak to that, Jim. Is all hope lost at this point if they've done that last year or do they have time to be able to fix that before they file taxes this year? Uh, you still have time to fix it. The way you fix it is you recharacterize the contribution. So then the IRS treats it as though it was made to a traditional IRA in the first place. And then you can just do the Roth conversion step. It's really not that big of a deal if it was just last year. But I got an email today from someone who's been doing this since 2018. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What a mess to fix. They just realized it six years later that they have been 
illegally contributed to a Roth IRA. And there's a penalty on this. It's 6% per year. It's an excise tax on, you know, Ooh. inappropriate over contributions to an IRA. And so, you know, the IRS hasn't noticed yet, but do you really want to, you know, keep running that out at 6% a year to see if they notice in 20 or 25 years? Probably not. So I think what this person was actually going to do is they're going to do a recharacterization for last year. They were going to refile their taxes, married filing jointly for the two years before that. And uh, and then I think they were going to withdraw the excess contributions for the three years before that. But it's a mess. So bottom line, if you're a high earner, you think you might be a high earner. Or if you're filing married filing separately, you need to do your Roth IRA contribution via the backdoor Roth process. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is from Timothy, I believe. For those with high loans in dentistry where PSLF is not an option and are looking at private own, practice ownership, should private refinancing be a good option? Maybe I'll, I'll start on this. Absolutely, Timothy. And I, I think most dentist practice owners are, are much better off looking at refinancing. But are you able to do that when you got 500 grand in student loans? And you you got a seven hundred thousand dollar house, and now you're trying to buy the seven hundred thousand dollar practice. It can get overwhelming really quickly, right? Maybe you do save for a year or two or three when you're kind of getting your feet under you and 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 you know becoming more efficient, getting quicker. And but but then I think look looking to refinance is, is probably the best end game for you knocking these out in five to 10 years, which is generally the case for most most dentist practice owners. Is this a good time, I think, to mention save forgiveness? <sighs> yeah, why don't we do it, everyone? So, <laughs> so one of the things that we despise really more than anything at White Coat and SLA is those that have to stick around with their loans like a pet for 20 to 25 years called income-driven repayment forgiveness or taxable forgiveness. Who does this pertain to? Those that are not doing PSLF because they're working very part-time or they're in a private enterprise, which can sometimes be the case for dentists, chiropractors, for veterinarians. Your student loan balance has to be at least two and a half times your income for this to take shape. So if you were going to be an associate dentist making $150,000 per year, maybe single income household or you're single and you owe 400 grand in student loans, you may not be able to pay these back on a 10-year plan, right? Unless you move in with mom and dad. And I don't know if you can do that, right? You might be a candidate for IDR forgiveness in this case. And I've seen a couple recently, Jim, that have fit. And so save is over 20 years. Pay is over 25 years. So that's something that you really want to get into the weeds in if you're looking at this. And that's something else that we look at today. I mean, I know we've talked a lot about refinancing and, and, and PSLF, but IDR forgiveness that was really not an option for many has become more prevalent because of higher loan balances and you know, also the subsidy that comes with the SAFE program that has made the tax bomb in the future a lot less scary. Where if you owe $500,000 today and you pay the minimum amount and you're making a lot less than you owe, let's say $200,000 of income, you would owe $500,000 in student loans in 20 years from now. And yes, you're going to have to pay tax on that. And that 500 grand gets captured as if it were income. So there is some planning considerations there, but there may be a few of you out there that, that may want to look into 20 year forgiveness instead of refinancing. Yeah. I hate the idea of being in, in student <laughs> loan debt for 25 years, but they keep making this more and more and more attractive uh, to, to actually drag your student loans out for 25 years and, and get them forgiven. Even though the forgiveness becomes taxable at that point, it still might be the better mathematical move. Now, is it the best behavioral move? I don't know. Does this keep you in a job where you feel like you can't make more money because then you have higher student loan payments and so you make bad career decisions and your whole life, your whole financial life starts revolving around your student loan plan for 25 years? I hate it. 
I hate that this is the right plan for some people, but I think there are some people for whom it is. If you think you might be, it is well worth spending an hour with Andrew at studentloanadvice.com and making sure, running the numbers each way and making sure that this is the plan you want to pursue for the next two and a half decades. All right. And looks like, should we take one more here, Jim? Yeah, let's take one more and okay. maybe we'll call let's it do there. one more and we'll call it. This is coming in from Alex Ilka. What are ways you have seen doctors from various specialties dramatically increase their gross? You mentioned before how interest specialty income came before came before dramatically different. I think you're saying can be dramatically different. Yeah, here's the deal. I think most people overestimate the difficulty of doubling their income, quite frankly, and that includes doctors. Um, you know, a lot of times it means moving going to a different part of the country. Sometimes it means changing jobs. Sometimes it means more call. Sometimes it just means relocating the practice to someplace with a better payer mix. Oftentimes it means owning the business. Typically business owners make more money than employees, particularly as you hire more and more and more people. We had some people on the podcast not that long ago, doctors with net worths of 30 or 40 or $50 million. Well, how did they get that? They built a big practice where they had 20 different doctors and APCs working for them. Um, you know, that's how you get those sorts of levels of wealth. Um, but certainly it can be done without, you know, building a huge practice. You can build a relatively small practice and you just look at the things that people who are making good money in your specialty are doing and you copy them. It's not that complicated. Talk to people about their incomes, what they're doing and make sure you're getting paid fairly. You know, surprisingly, a lot of docs, about half of docs, in fact, precisely half of docs make less than the average income. And why is that? That is because they don't realize they're being paid less than average. You know, yes, some of them have a sweetheart deal where they only got to work two and a half days a week or they never take call or they're only seeing one patient an hour or whatever. But for the most part, they're just people who don't realize what they're worth. They don't understand what the going rate is for their work. And so knowing how much you should be paid and negotiating and making sure you're actually being paid a fair market price can go a long way. I'm amazed that I keep running into docs. You know, for example, I met a couple of pediatricians that are in Chicago. They're making like $120,000 a year. And I told them, you know, the average pediatrician is making $225,000 a year right now. And, uh, and they said, oh, that's impossible for us. It can't be done. Meanwhile, I'm talking to other docs in Chicago who are pediatricians who are making four times that much. So don't believe that it can't be done. Uh, figure out how to do it and uh, make those changes in your life uh, until you get to the point where you're like, I'm not willing to work more. I'm not willing to make changes. I'm fine with what I'm making. Great. But if you're still in a position where you still need to build wealth, you need, still need to retire debt from your financial plan, um, you know, start looking around at ways that you can make more money. Because I assure you, there are doctors in your specialty who are making more money, far more money than the average for that specialty. All right. I think that's going to be our last question. Thank you so much. Those of you who have hung around to the end. I think we still got 57 of you online. You've been going at it now almost three hours. So I commend you on your dedication to your future financial life. I promise you, if you pay some attention to your finances, this stuff is not that hard. It's way easier than learning medicine or dentistry, and it will pay rich dividends. Becoming financially literate at the beginning of your career probably means the difference of two or three million dollars over the course of your career. And that is, uh, you know, money that you can use to improve your own life, to be able to improve your practice and help more patients, to be able to ease the burdens of your family and friends, and to be able to support your favorite charities. So um, pay attention to your finances. I promise it'll be worth it. If you have more questions come up, feel free to email us. We're grateful for what you're doing. This is not an easy career path that you've chosen. Not only does it often involve a huge student loan debt at the beginning, uh, but it doesn't get dramatically easier once you get into it. Thank you for dedicating your life to helping those who are sick and injured. And uh, we'll see you around at the White Coat Investor. The hosts of The White Coat Investor are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is for your entertainment and information only. 
It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation.